to the Safety Doc Podcast with author, radio host, and nationally recognized safety expert, Dr. David Perodin. Join us each week as we discuss the best and most bizarre practices in safety preparation and crisis response. Follow Dr. Perodin on Twitter at SafetyPhD. And remember, the truth will keep you safe. Hey, everybody. It is your good friend, Dr. David Proden from down here in the North Star Recording Studio, where I just uh, showed you the brand new updated intro for the show. So I like it. Um, so I'm going to use that one for a while and kind of switch it out, do something else. But um, but yeah, change it up a little bit. So hope you enjoyed it. Hope the audio is good. Um, and <laughs> also, also um, like I... I need to update my software because my my lighting things are kind of washed out. Although, um, you know, I guess it looks good. But uh, anyway, welcome, welcome, welcome. I was outside today for eight hours working on my yard, which I think is wonderful. I mean, it's beautiful to be outside and doing hands-on stuff. Um, three months from now, yeah, everything will be snow covered here. So. Welcome to uh, Robert. I see Swamp Dog Armory, Solitude Surfer. Who else is over here? Heath. All right. Hey, welcome, everybody. Um, I have a terrific show on. It's Andrew. It's Andrew. Hey, buddy. Um, I have a terrific show on deck. This is a show I wanted to do for a while. It's on lost person behavior. So not missing persons, not like kidnapped or something like that. This is lost person. This is somebody who like wanders away or this is the hiker, right? After, you know, being out all day, can't find the way back. So um, there was someone, Robert Koyster, okay? In 2008, came out with this book, Lost Person Behavior. And what he did is he analyzed uh, hundreds of thousands of cases of people who had wandered and came up with patterns, right? So if you were um, somebody with dementia, this is likely where you were found, right? This distance from where you wandered, like you went in a straight line. If you were a child with autism, you know, this is likely your your pattern. And I mean, it's really sophisticated. Um, so I'm going to to go inside and just kind of show you, like, here's child four to six. And then he gives, like, roam ranges of, like, where they typically were found. Um, you know, how many hours they were out before they were found. What Even the, he breaks it down into temperatures. So, like, you know, if it's 46 degrees out, you know. Um, and then also the he has something called initial reflex tasking. And that is for the the searchers of what they should do immediately. Um, so this is extremely well put together. Um, one of the things with this book is, why well, I wanted to talk about it was, um, it's not something you could grab after something happened, right? Because you wouldn't have time to go through this book and make sense of it and understand how it's put together and then apply it to a dynamic situation. That just wouldn't be possible. So we're going to talk about it now of like this exists and I'm not really sure how many um, how many people are aware of it. Uh, Swamp Talk is asking me, what do I think about missing 411? So yeah, I am very familiar with David Polite's work and his, his uh, books and documentaries, missing um, 411, such as people who go out to hike for a day and, and you know, they, they end up missing. And then a year later, you know, they're, clothes and everything show up in a different area of a state park or something like that. I think it's amazing. Uh, you know, David Pilates is uh, an investigator. And yeah, I mean, he, his work is incredible. And, and his 411, um, you know, I, I guess series, I would call it, uh, is intriguing. And it does have a very strong coupling into, you know, kind of what I'm talking about today. So yeah, that's some amazing stuff, right? And uh, one of the things like that David Pleides does is, you know, you look at things afterwards and it's like, how, how is this possible? Like, so I don't know. Oh God, I hope we're not running the glitch stuff over here. I've got my my monitor in there. I think we're okay. 
Um, so a welcome here to our good friend Toy Town, Incorporated, by the way. So, yeah. Um, Song Dog is saying, oh, geez, I almost put you in timeout. Sorry to do that, Song Dog. Especially the Hunter. Yeah, Hunter is one. Hunter is covered in um, Lost Person Behavior by um, Robert Koyster. Robert Koyster. So what's interesting is that there's a there's a variation here because Robert Koyster in, you know, indicates that hunters likely will recognize when they're lost and they will stay put, you know, build a fire, do whatever, and wait till morning and try to find their way out. So that's different than 411 um, with David Pilates, for example, of where hunters become lost and never, you know, are, are never found again or else, you know, the, the remnants of hunters or their belongings are found, you know, a year or two later in something that would seem really, really kind of a bizarre outcome. So, yeah. So if any of you know David Polites, contact him, ask him to be on the show and talk about this. Um, Gormonger, welcome, buddy. It pokes up, Bob. Holy smokes, man. Thanks. This is different than the podcast where, you know, you... <laughs> You're hanging around and there's like a thousand people watching. But I appreciate you very much for being here. Thanks, buddy. So, yeah. And Swamp Dog is saying new hunters can become unaware of how exhausted you can get out in the wilderness. If you're not... Yeah, absolutely right. Um, people don't test their limits or, you know, their, their equipment. Don't bring enough water with them and stuff like that. I learned that during um, my biking so when I first started to do distance biking, um, I, you know, I, I was learning, like, as I went along, you have to bring a lot of water. So as I post pictures of my distance biking, right, I am, I'm packing two gallons of water and I'm like hydrating like crazy, like a camel before then, but I'm packing two gallons of water and I have places where I can stop. There's like a bar next to like this river. I could stop if I had to go in and get water and, and, um, uh, you know, there's, there's a few places, but, um, and then also the, um, you know, the things that I pack, like I pack a lot more food than I used to, you know, when I pack food, it's like bananas, right. I'm packing things where I can, can understand how they will be metabolized or like a quick hit of like, you know, sugar or like, you know, sodium or something like that. So those are the things I learned about because I'd be, I'd, I'd cramp up like my hamstrings and quads and stuff like that when I bike. And I don't have that problem anymore, even if I bike a hundred miles. Uh, but yeah, like as a new cyclist, you probably would, um, you know, you wouldn't think about those things quite as much. So I spent a lot of time being very thoughtful on what I, what I pack for the bikes. It is our good friend Bolo from Canada. Bolo, welcome, buddy. And uh, thanks for pumping up those watch hours. Uh, for those of you who enjoy this channel, this is podcast episode 184 of the Safety Doc Podcast. And that's a good thing, 184 episodes. I do a blog post for each one of these at safetyphd.com. You can go down in the description for the show. You can kind of read the blog post already. Although I did like build it out a little bit more in the actual uh, safetyphd.com where it will appear tomorrow. Um, it's a, And you can go in and download every one of my shows on Podbean as an mp3 if you want to listen to it so thank you so much because yeah 184 episodes is quite an accomplishment to release in uh with also a corresponding blog post of about 600 words um and then a you know in level mp3 uh so you know that's it's really been great and i i, I have a couple of guests coming on i have an i have a private um airplane pilot who will be on my show um so we've been in communication. We're going to talk again this week, and I'll probably have him on in the next week or two. And he's going to talk about, you know, the safety things if you're a private pilot, right? And discretion. Well, you got to make the call. Like, hey, the engine just cut out. I have to, like, land here or whatever. Uh, so that's going to be fascinating because I haven't had anybody on to talk about that. And he said there's some parallels to, like, school safety. So we'll see. We'll see what that looks like. And then also Lisa Linney or Linne is going to return to the show. That's our attorney friend from the Houston area. Um, Lisa's going to return to, to the show. We've been working on something for my fall legal class that I instruct. Well, I instruct a couple legal classes in fall, but um, in one of them, we have a question about, um, or I have a case study where a student with autism wanders away from a school and, 
you know, then like, what do you do? And usually, and we talked about that on, on one of these shows. Um, and typically it splits down the middle. Half of the administrators in that class who are first year administrators will say, I will, you know, I'll do whatever I can. Like if someone shows up with a drone, I'll use a drone to go search for them. And other people say like, I'll wait for first responders to get there and let them lead the rescue, right? So we'll talk a little bit about that today, but there's something called um, the law of necessity. It's really a defense. Um, I need to find it here. So I don't know, do I have it? Yeah, I think I do. But it is the law of necessity. So let me let me go to right. Law of necessity. It's a legal defense. So so like if you have to trespass on a neighbor's property to search for a missing fourth grader with autism, um, that is you could argue the law of necessity. Yeah, I'm breaking trespassing law, but if I don't find the student who's wandering and you know it's cold out and there's also a river nearby it could be catastrophic, right? So it's kind of like you, you're you admitting, right, that you're breaking one law, but there is something much greater at risk. So we're going to talk about the law of necessity with uh, Lisa Lene. You know, I'm so thankful to have her as a friend. I mean, when I teach these legal, legal classes, I'm not an attorney. So there are some times when I'll contact Lisa and say, hey, like, I want to talk about this and frame it, but I, I don't know, you know, the legal components of this exactly. Can you help me out? Of course she does. So she's an awesome person. So let's go over um, here to uh, from Swamp Dog Armory to me. Unrelated question, would you be interested in being a narrator for an upcoming VR history project? I don't, maybe, I don't, yeah, I have to learn more about that. Via, like virtual reality history? Project? I don't know. So um, I would be glad to. I would say if you can tolerate my voice, right? And I, um, when I narrate at School of Airs, thank you to my um, sound engineer, you know, for all the work he put into editing that and making it sound great. So like when you listen to it, it sounds like I'm awesome. And like, I never made one mistake throughout the whole thing. That was actually a pretty difficult process for me to, to read and, and narrate the book and bring the energy that a narration needs. But, but my answer is Swamp Dog is of course. Yeah. Let's, let's talk more. Um, Gormonger is saying, my quick rundown on two points is that your average person who isn't familiar with nature and hiking gets lost. True. Yeah. Um, survival skills aren't taught regularly, publicly, or at home. Absolutely, Gormonger. And we'll get into that a little bit later in the show because um, I asked the question in this, this show, right? Do schools train for law students? And the answer, <laughs> kind of a spoiler here, is no. Uh, really, nobody trains for that. Nobody has a protocol for that. Nobody does a tabletop exercise. And um, I get it, right? Because it's it's unlikely, but it's not impossible. And we'll talk about that. There are actually, um, it, it, across the US, more than 100 students a year with autism wander away from schools during the school day. And that number continues to increase. And it could be students with intellectual disability and, and so forth. So. I, and I do think that actually doing an, an exercise on a law student allows you to address a lot of things in your safety protocol um, outside of just like a law student, right? Like how do you use your two-way radios to communicate? Where do you stage assets? Like how do you communicate out to the public? How do you interface with volunteer resources? Like people with drones come and help out. So I think it's really a great exercise to do as a tabletop or, or actually like a simulation in a school. Um, because schools typically do what for an exercise? They do active shooter exercises, right? Like, you know, they, they go full, you know, um, you know, theater productions, you know, paint up people blood and, and all of that stuff. And I'm like, you know, if you did a law student exercise and involved your outside agencies, your police and fire and all of that, and even community, I think you'd learn a lot about your rescue systems without having to get very dramatic. So, uh, but hey, Gormonger, thanks for that question, buddy. Yeah, and so I'm done. Of course, man, I'd be glad to work with you. Um, that's something I've actually been thinking about. This is a Swamp Tiger Armory, abundant tech that allows self-tracking of drones for video and have a bracelet for phone. Yeah, it's a good it's a good point. Like you're starting to to pick into some of the, the show already. Um, there are some people, right, people with um, prone to wandering, whether they have dementia or whether it's students with autism, children with autism, 
where um, people will will put a GPS beacon on that person, like an Apple tag, right? So you can you can track them. And then also if you have a drone, how does that interface? You might be able to track somebody via drone. That's probably not quite there for technology yet, which is a great question because one of my friends, Preston Rice, who was on the show twice and we went out and, and demonstrated drones. You can find those episodes, really cool. Um, he has a drone business. And you know, I was talking to him a few weeks ago and said, hey, I'd love to have you back on to talk about some of the updates with drones because he's been selling drones to communities and and fire departments for, for search and rescue. And he said, oh my God, Dave, just in, since we did that show two, three years ago, things have changed so much in the drone, um, you know, what's available for drones and also drone protocol. So that'd be really great. So yeah, the question is like, could you use a drone to kind of link up to if a student has some kind of RFID bracelet or some kind of tracking device on them, you know, who is a student who's prone to, to wandering or a person with dementia, right? I, I worked in a nursing and rehab center uh, for a few years early in my career. And, you know, when you would press the door to exit, it would be a delayed exit. You have to press it for 15 seconds and then the door would open because you'd have people with dementia or Alzheimer's, right? Or, you know, that would that would try to leave the building, especially at night. There's something called sundowners where at night people try to leave facilities if they have dementia. And actually, I think I'll do a show on that sometime. But uh, but yeah, so so we'll talk about that. Um, I'd like to have Preston back on to specifically talk about the, what's happening with the drones. Kind of a GP, GPS be beacon tied to an autonomous drone that could find a person. Yeah, absolutely true. And I think that technology exist. I don't think it's exactly linked to like a device, but this is really good Swamp Dog Armory because like these will be questions. These will be questions I'll ask this fall in my superintendent, you know, legal class, right? Like um, in my special education director's class, you know, should you be having the discussion? If you do have a student who has any history of wandering from a building, do you use a tracking device on that student? And then how do you actually track them if they're gone? So these are really good questions. And I know people kind of cringe because they're like, oh my God, you know, we're tracking people. I get it, right? I get it. But there are certain times um, when I think this is a, a very valid and appropriate technology to, to use. And those would be times when you have a student, a child with autism who's wandered six times from their house, right? Um, or, you know, in addition from the school and you're looking and saying, what, what can we do if this does happen where we have another tool in our toolbox. So it's really good. Um, yeah. So what I was mentioning too, also like we have to be, um, to, you know, use our skills and not just have a, a kind of a sold out reliance on GPS because like what if GPS, you know, doesn't, doesn't work, you know, what, what do we, what do we go with? And GPS is, and sometimes I'll say, I got to run. I'm out of here, man. I'm doing eight shows a day. I appreciate you, Swamp Dog. I'm, hey, by the way, like I'm like I have 1,197 subscribers, so I'd like to get to 1,200. And also, I am um, less than a thousand hours to being uh, monetized. So, those of you watching the show, or those of you willing to watch the show on your 10 devices tomorrow, think about that. Help out the doc. So uh, Gormonger is saying there's a good percentage of Alzheimer autistic children who actually get lost and die. Makes it so yeah, true. Um, so, and, and again, we'll, we'll talk about that, uh, that tonight. So these are, you know, these are really good points. And what I want to, you know, point out too, is like, this isn't, this isn't addressed in schools. Um, it's not part of their, their flow chart for disasters or crisis. And, you know, my, the question comes up, well, should it be, David? Should it be part of something that schools train for? I would say yes if you have a student who has wandered previously. If you're aware of a student with wandering behavior, then yes. Otherwise, probably not because it's just not likely it's going to happen. And if you practice for it, you're probably not going to remember exactly what to do. Although, like, right, if you had some basic thing on lost person behavior, um, a tabletop exercise, some training, I think it would be helpful because schools wouldn't know what to do, right? Do you assemble? Who do you assemble? Who do you call? 
from your staff to get together and say like, hey, we're going to go out and search. Like, where are you going to search? How are you going to space out? How are you going to communicate? You know, what if you do trespass into other areas during your search? What do you do when responders arrive? Or do you wait for responders? If it's a rural school district, in Wisconsin, 421 school districts, a lot of them are rural. When I say rural, I'm talking like a school and a couple houses by it, and it might be 10 minutes before the first police officer arrives, or arrives much less a, a rescue team. So, you know, what do you do? How do you interface with these, these groups? So I think this is a really uh, uh, great question. And also, though, you know, the point I want to bring up is I think lost person behavior, lost student this makes an excellent tabletop ex exercise or just like functional exercise where a school actually does this. Because again, you're testing your two-way radio communications, how you assemble assets, how you assemble with outside agencies or just outside people who want to help, right? Um, and situational awareness, how, you're, how you are committing assets, who's got professional discretion, like all of these things get assessed during that type of exercise. Yeah, like most people don't do that, right? I don't think they, they think about it. When schools do a tabletop exercises or full on exercises, right? What they wanna do is they wanna go for like the intruder, you know, who is shooting up a school and stuff like that. And they don't tend to think like there are other ways we could assess our general safety systems, our, our general protocols and extra, who has discretion and interface with outside agencies and commitment of assets and stuff like that without using the intruder exercise. So, uh, and I wanna keep going through the chat here. It's, it's, it's awesome. So, Swamp Dog Armory, there's a difference when it's a voluntary system, not a government owned system. Good point, yeah, it, and I think that's, that would be a question, right? I, I haven't seen in any of these new safety bills, like Safer Communities Bill, which was passed last month, right? I haven't seen anything to to address things like this, right? Like uh, I would improve safety if we had a wandering student, or not, a, not even a wandering student, but a wandering person with dementia, right, in our community. I mean, if we take that, that happens in, you know, um, hundreds, if not thousands of times across the, the country every year. So like, I mean, how do we do that? Um, Toy Town saying, I lost my grandmother due to dementia and wandering was involved in hit and run. Oh my God, that's horrible. Uh, I'm very sorry for that. Um, so, wow, Toy Town. Um, yeah, I'm, man, I'm sorry to hear that. Doc, the second point was skip, maybe filter because of, <laughs> oh my God. Really? Okay. Well, let me let me go through what I'm going to talk about today. So, um, so what I'm going to talk about today. Well, let me let me just kind of start. Out. I've got my notes over here on the left. Um, between the years 2004 and 2014, so that 10 year span, the U.S. national parks alone, and U.S. national parks. This kind of goes into David Polite stuff. Um, the U.S. national parks. There were 46,690 or six, 46,609, right? So 46,609, um, which I'll put in here. Um, individuals who became lost and required a search and rescue campaign. Think about that. In 10 years, 46,000 people became lost to the point where they required a search and rescue campaign. So like, you know, 4,000 a year more than 4,000 a year, with, with a cost of $51.4 million in total. That's from the FBI. Um, so what we'll do today is we're going to look at characteristics of lost persons and who has the discretion and authority to commit uh, agency resources to find them. So th those will be kind of the, the big points. And we'll get into like what this looks like in schools because obviously that's what I do. So, so yeah, so just so we know how frequent this is, just if we take national parks alone, we're not talking about nursing and rehab centers, we're not talking about assisted living, people that live at home that have dementia or brain injury, we're not talking about kids with autism. If we just take national parks, um, we have about, um, uh, you know, 4,000 4, people a year conservatively who have become lost to the point where a search and rescue campaign was initiated for that person in in the U.S. So that's pretty that's pretty big numbers, right? Like that's that's big stuff. Um, 
So Robert Koyster, you can you can find him on the internet again, Robert Koyster, K-O-E-S-T-R. 2008 came out with his book, Lost Person Behavior, where he um, he analyzed you know, hundreds of thousands of cases of people getting lost. He looked at every variable he could, right? Time of day, temperature, you know, if they were found, how far it was from the point they got lost, what their age was, you know, if they were a child, child with autism, if they were a hunter, if they were somebody who was scavenging for berries, right? He had 41 categories where he was able to, to break people, lost people down and that lost people into and then, you know, passage of time from the rescue and all of that. So it's amazing stuff. Again, it's one of those, those things where you couldn't just pull this book out. If somebody was lost, it, you'd never be able to make sense of it in a timely manner, but it's good to know that this exists out there and can inform. It's a great read by the way, but um, can help inform your rescues um, ahead of time. So, um, this actually started back in the 1970s with Bill Saratuk. So here's the guy, Bill Saratuk. Uh, credit where credit is due. In the 1970s, he started this. I believe he had eight categories of lost persons. Um, and and then it was really, again, Robert Koyser who took over in 2008 with, with the book I just showed you and continually updates and does presentations. And there's, you know, I think he has like 20 publications out there. So, um, yeah, and this is called a search and rescue guide on where to look for land, air, and water. So again, it's one of those things if, when I bring it to class, I bring it to my superintendent class and I'm like, you know, or my special education director's class. I'm like, have you ever heard about this? And they'll be like, no, I never heard. I don't have any idea. Like, you know, what would you do if you had a student, with, you know, wander from your school, a student with autism? They're like, I don't know. We call 911. And I'm like, okay. Um, so let's dig into this. Hey, it's welcome to Vanessa Kitty. Hey, Vanessa, welcome to you. Um, Gormonger, second goes into how easy it is. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, and this show isn't about like kidnapping and an abduction or anything like that. This is, this will stay on um, if somebody has wandered away on their, their own, either due to, you know, autism um, contributing to it or, or dementia or brain injury, but not being coerced to, to leave, right? There's all the other area, right? Cormonger, we could, Cormonger, we could go into, um, so, hey, and hello to our good friend. Chris is not here, but Chris is here, and he's a friend of the show. So thank you, Chris. So again, we have um, in the National Parks alone, 4,000 people getting lost. I always wonder, like, do you get charged for the rescue? Like, um, how does that work? Um, if, you're, if you're found, right, do you get charged for the rescue? I don't know. That's where I have to go in and check with a couple people on that. So, and I wonder if that's like a hesitation for people to call for help. In a school setting, I would say no, because the school, you know, would, would assume that whatever would come out of their budget. But, um, you know, if it's like a hunt, a hunter getting lost or a hiker, or whatever, and things like that, I, I just, I, I kind of wonder if people hesitate a little bit. Like if you forensically question people afterwards, like, was well, there any reason you didn't call for a rescue team earlier? And they might say, yeah, because I didn't want to get charged, you know, Twenty-two thousand dollars to have the the team, you know, compiled and, and do the search. I don't know. Um, so there's something called the Lost Behavior app. So this is pretty interesting. So let me bring this up. I want to bring this on another screen because I found something. I had um, here it is. <laughs> this is a this is a weird thing here. So let's get into this. Um, there's a there's an app called Lost Person Behavior, and it's based on everything that we're saying, right? It's available offline. And let me share a screen so you get, it, get an idea of this. All right, so there it is. Lost Person app. This is from the Department of Homeland Security, the Division of Science and Technology. Interesting. It's archived, meaning um, this, this was released on September 9, 2005. It hasn't been updated since then. Here's the app. So lost person behavior app, um, 
using data from over 1, 150,000 missing person cases across the country, the app provides guidance, technical briefings, investigative questions, and statistics for over 40 scenarios. So I guess this would be useful, but again, like if this is actually happening to download this, to have this app on your phone, I, I, maybe it would be helpful. I just don't think if you haven't practiced with it, this, if you're trying to interface with it the first time and you're trying to tell people about on your rescue mission here, your other, your other rescuers, I don't think it'd be very effective, but, um, but here's the deal, right? Um, so this app was developed by the Department of Homeland Security. So I was trying to learn more about this app and I realized like you can't, the only place you can get this app, I'm going to bring this up in a minute. Um, the only place you can get this this app really is off of like the app stores. Um, and, and something surprised me about this. Um, so let me, let me bring this thing up. All right. So I'm going to bring back. So it is available on Amazon, right? And it's $9 and 95 cents. So, <laughs> Uh, there's a there's a weird thing here, right? Like, how in the world is this app not free? You know, we spend billions, we get billions of dollars to European countries. We pass the Safer Communities Bill and the Anti-Inflation Bill and whatever. But the Safer Communities, which has to do with community safety and student safety and that. And we, we don't have a free version of the Lost Person Behavior app. Granted, $9.95. I'm not against... Th- whoever has developed this app of getting paid, but have them get paid from the government, right? I mean, this is crazy that this app is $9.95. This is nuts. So here is, uh, you know, here's what shows up on the app. And actually here's like, I think the most valuable part. So, so well, at least I thought it was, but let's go back over here. So, I mean, it's pretty technical. Like, if you're panicked, right, it's it's unlikely you're going to make a lot of sense out of this. But let's go over here. I think this is the most useful part, tactical brief. So this is for, what is the scenario here that they have? Um, I'm not sure. But anyway, they're saying for this one, um, they go until they're stuck, brief, on, oh, so it's a person with dementia. So the, a person with dementia will go typically in a straight line. If they go to a fence, they'll climb right over it, right? Uh, brief on verbal skills, typically non-responsive, search brush and thick hair. So, I mean, crossing roads is likely. So this is different than like a, a young child. A young child's likely to find some place that um, they feel comfortable with and just kind of stay there, right? And stay hidden and not respond to like other people because they've thought, been taught stranger danger. Young young kids are very unlikely per lost behavior, um, per lost person behavior studies to go very far. So um, once located, approach from the front, make eye contact, nonverbal is important, speak slowly. And so this is, um, this is, again, this is on Amazon and, but, you know, let's look at this. I I have a very strong ethical problem with this. Like, this is, this should not be a app that we have to pay for. It just shouldn't be. I mean, again, it started with the Department of Homeland Security in 2018. And why isn't this out of everything that's funded in Safer Communities bill, right? Different like school safety, but just like in Safer Communities is Safer Community, which includes people who wander, lost person. I mean, this is kind of nuts. Again, I believe if, if now I don't know, like now DBS Productions, like is this, you know, who, who this has been handed off to, but then, I mean, they should be paid by, by the government on this. Um, this app should be free to everybody. Um, I, I just, I, I don't get it. <laughs> and there's one customer rating, like, right. What does this customer rating say? It's probably Bolo wrote this. It's Bolo. My God, Bolo. No, it's Zippy wrote this. Um, I've just completed my LPD course and be using this with my Grampian data. I don't know what any of this means. Very handy. The first pages of HRMP search. You are swamped. 
yeah, it's pretty technical. This person like obviously knows what they're doing in search and rescue, but, but like it is, and that's from 2015. Like nobody has posted a review for this in seven years. So that's a minor rant, right? Like this app should be free. And also I can tell you that none of my school administrators will have any idea that this even exists. This has never covered at school safety conferences because school safety conferences sell out to vendors. The vendor is paying them ten or twenty thousand dollars for the booth out front, and then also for like a breakaway session after the keynote. Um, th- this should be talked about, right? I mean, there are a lot of schools who have students with autism, and also might, if they, you know, do an inquiry, students with autism who have wandered, and then this app would be applicable. And even if this doesn't happen. You, you could still interface with the app. You could understand, you know, GPS location. Um, you could, you know, uh, th- there's a lot of stuff you could gain from, from interfacing with this during an exercise, right? So, and, and I guess, you know, we go into it further, like how many assisted living environments and how many um, nursing homes, right, would have any idea. So... So, yeah, um, I don't know. This one really irks me, though, because when I went and I found the app, right, I was like, oh, well, this is really cool. Like, I'm going to include it in my class. I'm going to talk about it. And then, you know, I learned that, well, you know, the only way you can get the app now is through this third party, you know, which is, I'm glad somebody provides it, but it's $9.95 for something that should be free. And I'm not saying third party shouldn't be paid. Sure, of course it should be. But um, this really just frosts me. I'm just, I have no, I have no time for this. This is complete garbage. And I wanted to talk about on the show, this really pissed me off that this, that this is up. And again, no one ever knows about these things. No one built a table. I built a tabletop on this. I'll actually use it with my students. And it's awesome, by the way, but uh, nobody talks about this stuff. So, um. Yeah, pretty junky, right? I mean, that's just a garbage, that's just a garbage move. It really is a garbage move to not make that app free. And again, I'm not pointing the finger at the vendor. The vendor does the work, whoever develops this needs to be compensated. But the fact that this is not available to us is just nuts. You know, it goes along those lines of, right, like saying, yeah, you know, why insulin isn't capped, right? Uh, for for people why there isn't a cap cost on that but anyway lost person behavior app yeah it's great it has everything it downloads you don't need a a web connection to access it but you got to pay the 9.95 you got to be familiar i guess with how to interface with it that's one thing people do this is what's called cognitive offloading i wrote about it in the velocity of information by the way go down here velocity of information um i don't know it's the best book about contemporary times, you know, how people function 90 days in the chaos and beyond. This is an awesome book. It's up for the SI High Cow Award, which is the, the best book written um, in semantics or word meaning. But check it out. You can get it on Amazon places that sell books. And the audiobook will release on April 12th, 2023, by contract with my publisher. It has to release one day after the one year anniversary. But anyway, this is an awesome book. And and you can get it in paperback. This is hard copy, but there are also a number of figures in this book, which there's a slim chance I'll be able to find one of the 471 end notes, 12 interviews, but a lot of custom figures that I had made with Amy Case T. Defano, my graphic designer. So this is an awesome book. Um, and then, of course, by the way, School of Errors, Rethinking School Safety America, available in paperback for $22, available in an audiobook for $7.99 from Downpour. This is a tremendous book, right? Just how schools function <laughs> with safety, right? How that interface really happens. And um, and there's also great stuff in here about um, a couple chapters chapters on the 9-11 rescue of 500,000 people in nine hours from lower Manhattan. How that happened. Nobody looked at it in the way that I looked at it with the New York City, City Department of Planning I worked with and Dr. Paul Rapp, head of military medicine. That's really awesome. Could be its own book by its own. It's kind of in this book. So like when you're going through this, you're like, oh my God, there's this stuff in here. This is a great book. If you're a parent, if you want to know how your taxpayers are, taxpayer dollars are being spent. My taxes are going up like $800. I just looked and like, yikes. But yeah, School of Errors and then Velocity of Information. 
And then, you know, Lost Person Behavior is a great book, but it's not like a conversational book. It's pretty technical. So you can watch uh, some of Robert Koyster's stuff online. Um, you know, the book is, is valuable, though, if you're um, into school safety or, you know, residential facility safety. So, um, so let me, let me see here. Uh, let me go back. I'm going to go through in just a moment here, the, uh, 13 facts about lost person behavior that I learned from Robert, um, Koyster's book. And also this is from a blog post from Karen Hume. So I give her credit on that. Um, but yeah, so Zippy is saying, Hey, it's government at work, like paying to be in prison. <laughs> yeah, I remember my friend Larry Lawton, who I interviewed in the book, you know, of, of talking about that. But um, yeah, to me, this is really, uh, really wrong. Like this is, this is, I, these, these are the gaps you see when you look at school safety funding. When you look at what gets funded for school safety, like schoolsafety.gov, which never needed to be funded. We already had a clearinghouse for school safety, rems.ed.gov, readiness and emergency management. And you get to see like the turnover in organizations and the people really don't know what exists. So they just like come up with new stuff. And no one is a steward of, of this stuff, right? There's a lot of entropy. People just forget, like no one knows really in government, right? There's lost person behavior app exists and 4,000 people a year get lost in state parks and you have to have a rescue. Like this app would be helpful, but no one knows. And then you charge 995 for it. I'm like, you gotta be kidding me. You've got to be kidding me. This is nuts. Who the hell comes up with this stuff? And, and yeah, it's got one review from, you know, 2000. That's because no one's going to download it for $9.95. And if they do, it's in the moment when they've never interfaced with it before. And it won't make any sense to them. You've got to be kidding me. So, yeah. All right. All right. Hey, it's government at work, like paying to be. I think I did that one. Hey, Zip. There's no money in found kids. Hey, Andrew, there's no money in, in, in really presenting on this at a conference, even a breakout. Like, I, I just don't, this, nobody wants to hear about this at conference. It's all about intruders and bulletproof windows and ballers and stuff like that. This is this would be phenomenal to do as a, as a case study breakout, right? To talk about how to do a case study. Again, to assess your two-way communication staging assets. Community members who might hear about this, right, from their scanner app, right, that, hey, there's a search going on. They show up with a drone. Do you use their drone or not? Um, just in general, how do you how do you integrate people who show up for a rescue? Maybe some of these people wouldn't pass your school test, background test, to be a, a volunteer, right? <laughs> but yet, like, you're, you know, would you include them in a rescue? Do you wait for the police or fire department to just take over this? How do you involve your school staff? What if school staff get injured while rescuing, attempting a rescue on private property? I mean, you know, we could talk about these things. Um, how do people communicate with each other? How do they mark the zones that they've they've been in? And situational awareness, right? I don't know, so many things. So sometimes I've, again, I learned early on in school safety that if you if you enter the channel where the money flows, right, you can see the money going down the center of the channel at you know 30 miles an hour, like all the money for bulletproof films and you know for windows and bollards and surveillance cameras. Like you jump in there, like you're surrounded by money. Now, if you kind of stay like in my area, which is like, oh, like threat reporting systems, and you know, let's do um, an exercise with you know interagency exercise with police and fire right about like a wandering student like that's off on the side that's where the slow water is you know that's you know it might be deep it might be important but that's not the that's not the uh, center channel right that's not where people are are looking so um but anyway i just i just think it's i i think have, charging for the app is ridiculous Gormonger to uh, to Zippy. Yeah, Bill always goes to the tax. People are hesitant to even call an ambulance. This is a good point, Gormonger. Sure, pay for gas. I um, I think there's a point in here that I I want to I want to highlight, right? And that's the fact is there's hesitation for people to call for help, especially nowadays, because you can get charged for thousands of dollars for not only an ambulance, right? But if there's a rescue team put together. 
Um, or what does it cost if the fire department comes out to my house, right? I mean, all of these things. And I think we need to be m more transparent in that. You know, what does insurance pick up and what, does, what doesn't what does it pick up? But, um, but this is a good question, right? This is a really good question. I remember back when my grandfather died. He was a, he was deer hunting and he had a heart attack while out deer hunting and the Ambulance was called in the rural area, right? But this ambulance, this was back, you know, 25 years ago. The ambulance fee was really high. And, you know, it it was like, oh my God, you know, like who picks how does how did you determine this fee? You know, like to come out here and I understand, you know, right? There's a cost and ambulance. And you know, when a fire department shows up to a, a fire, they might be bringing two million dollars worth of equipment. You know, ladder truck is 1.5 million. A pumper is easily a half million. You know, plus their their firefighters. Um, so I I think there needs to be some clarity, and I'm glad you brought this up. There needs to be some clarity. If you, again, these people who are lost, if you're searching for a lost kid, like you need to understand: will you be charged? Will you not be charged? Because I think there's some hesitation up front with that, or an elderly person, right, who wanders because of dementia from home or assisted living or, or nursing, but say a home. I think there's some level of hesitation with people because they're, oh my God, I don't want to get charged. And I saw that in schools. As an administrator, um, we would call sometimes um, 911 because we'd administer an EpiPen. A student would have a reaction. And after a few times, parents would be like, well, can you just call me first because I have to call, you know, I have to pay for the ambulance, stuff like that. Well, we can't do that. You know, once we administer the EpiPen, we're calling 911. We can call you after 911. But, um, you know, 911 is still being called and emergency services are coming to the school. And a parent would say, you know, this is costly. And I get it, right? So, but I, but this is the part when we should be addressing this in our safer communities bill, like our safer communities types, this stuff which really affects people, right? Like this is, this is where people are. I mean, if again, like let's say you have a family member who wanders. And there's a rescue and suddenly like you end up with a bill for $22,000. Like there should be something in place for that at a government level, right? Of, of supporting a search and rescue for a lost person. Um, because like we have all these other things we can put in place for, you know, for, for the service, a billion dollars in the schools for mental health. Like why isn't this there for, for, you know, people who, who wander and there's a search, you know, team put together. And people will be like, well, in a search team is going to be charging so much. Well, it's, garbage right like but this is this is it's a very good point that that was brought up here is i think people are becoming hesitant to call for emergency services like we live a mile away from the the helo pad at our hospital for the helicopter right the emergency helicopter. And that thing is flying out like 10 times a day like i'll be outside you know you know and that thing is always going overhead and I'm like, every time that thing flies, like that's what five, ten thousand dollar bill. Like, what's the what's the deal here? Like, who's picking that up? And but especially when when kids are involved in, and uh, you know those those type of of uh, search and rescues, um, I think there's some hesitation on that. So it's a good point. Uh, it's a really good point. Um, this is our good friend Bacon Maldito from Inglewood, California, originally. This show is sponsored by the guy that beat the hell out of a person who said, not all those who wander are lost. Was it Tolkien? Right? <laughs> After being struck in the stuck in the woods for two weeks. That's funny. That's really funny. Bolo, watch ours. Come on, buddy. You are my you are my hope. Everything rests on your shoulders, and you are up for the challenge, Bolo. Um Go in and, and uh, find a few more devices off of Facebook Marketplace and get them logged into your uh, your Wi-Fi. This would be saying to me, deal with the med prices. Just open the IPs, pay twenty percent of IP. Yeah, so Zippy's really analytical. He's got he's got a lot of sensible solutions, which I appreciate. He's a good guy, um, <laughs> right? So, so it's one of those things like obvious stuff, like right? You don't charge for this the search and rescue app, and you, you know. And you don't make people hesitant to call for help because they'll get charged with this massive rescue thing, uh, re rescue fee. It's a good friend, the agorizer. Hello, buddy. Good evening. Um, I'm going to download it if my San Francisco Giant Pet wins. They got to lose by five points. Oh, my God, Andrew. 
Well, Andrew, we gotta help, we gotta get the doc monetized. It's the first thing we gotta do. Second thing is we got it. We we need to get more reviews. Everybody listening out there uh, for school uh, school of airs. My school safety book has fifty four reviews, and velocity of information has nineteen. Pretty pressing for velocity of information. If you've read it, right, um, to to do a review now because September that book is being um, considered for the uh, S.I. Cow Award for best semantic work, which is a major award, a major award. And um, so anyway, your reviews would really help that. Plus, like, the book is showing up in more and more libraries. And one of the biggest things that, that gets the attention of libraries, right, is that people post reviews for books, especially nonfiction. So I appreciate you know, all of you in here. You guys are intellectual. And I appreciate you, you doing that for me. It means a lot to me when I, I every morning I log in, I'm like, is there a new, is there a new review? You know, is, are people still thinking the book is current, right? So thanks. It's Heath. An interesting music video on a number of these topics. Look up Samson. What about us on YouTube? Thanks, Heath. Agorizer. Lost Ukrainian. Uh, Ukrainians eating up all the lost person funding. So, yeah, it's like, where, where does the funding, you know, go to again? What do we prioritize and where are we putting money versus? And again, how costly is it to pay the vendor to to? you know, for this, this lost person app and then have it available. Like it's, it's, the, you're not paying them a million dollars, right? I mean, I can't imagine that. So I just don't, I just, you know, some of these things seem really, really obvious and I want to, you know, bring them out here. So, uh, yeah. My other advice. Yeah. yeah thanks below. So yeah, I'm that, that helicopter is always out where I'm at. I actually, I like it. We live not far also from a community airport. So I kind of like that. Like if you didn't like airports, trains and helicopters, um, where I live wouldn't be the place for you because I've got all those things going on. When I grew up, I lived a half block from a railroad track. It was always in service. And now I'm, I'm further away, but like you, you can still, we're like a train hub. So you can still hear stuff go through, which I like. And in college, I live close to a railroad track. And, um, you know, the planes coming over and stuff like that. Like I said, I kind of, I, I like this stuff. So for me, there's no deterrent to that. Um, so anyway, lost person behavior. Hey, let's, let's check out 13 facts about lost people. This is from uh, lost person behavior with Robert Coyster. And I was able to take this, uh, from a blog post on in, um, 2017 by Karen Hume, and I do credit that out. I wasn't able to get a hold of her. Um, so, but I do have the link to it in the, in the description below to say, Hey, like, do you mind if I use this or whatever? But so, but I am properly citing it here and it, if it had fell up in the book for my own due diligence, but here's 13 facts about missing people. Um, and, and these 13 facts are um, just a moment right after this one minute commercial. So hang on. As chaos erupts, torrents of conflicting yet urgent messages gush from media outlets. What is the magnitude of the incident and what should people do to protect themselves? Dr. David P. Perodin teaches you how to prevent mental burnout by observing indicators and building a robust member check network. Reporter James David Dixon of the Detroit News proclaims, the velocity of information will empower its readers. Drawing on current events, history, interviews, and scholarship, the velocity of information is an education in the way people react and adapt to change in this fast-spinning world. Never has it been more important to sift facts and stories for truth and meaning. There are teachable moments on every page. By the Velocity of Information, Human Thinking During Chaotic Times. Available from your favorite bookstore or online retailer. All right, I am back. And that hopefully compelled you to consider the Velocity of Information. So I, don't, I know it's in paperback, it's like $35. I know that's not cheap, right? Um, but it is an awesome book. And also, it's in libraries all over the place. Um, so if you 
just email your local library, right? And just say, and say, hey, I live here and I want this book available in my library. A lot of libraries, a lot, like probably 90% will purchase it if someone in their community emails them and says, here's the book, here's the ISBN number, get it. And again, the audio book for that has already been recorded. Actually, it's already, I just have to press a button. <laughs> it's all done. It's all uploaded. It's all audio checked, um, uh, narrated by Ben Hawk. Um, and that will come out April 12th just needs my contract with my publisher. So, but, um, but yeah, anyway, Bacon, our good friend Bacon is saying, oh, I have an idea of just how much a uh, first response call is because a bowl of chaos had to eat the cost of one. She accidentally hit an old lady crossing the street and she had to be flown to Seattle. So yeah. So these, these are questions. This is really good Bacon because these are questions nobody brings up in a school setting, like at least proactively. And you don't hear this also at assisted living. Like I had a, a loved one in an assisted living you know, facility for, for two years. I worked in nursing rehab. You don't, you don't understand. No one's asking these questions. And then also like no one in legislation, right? We see safer communities, but there wasn't a slice of safer communities that focused on rescue of, you know, for whatever reason. And and to to have some limitations. So if there was some emergency, you know, your your kid with autism wanders, and there's a two hundred people search party put together in multiple agencies. You know, they find your child, and two weeks later, hand you a bill for forty thousand dollars. I mean, there are things like that that just are wrong, and should not happen. And and these are the things that that don't make it into legislation. No one even talks about. So. Yeah. Anyway, here's the 13 facts. Um, the first one is, it is a myth that we panic when lost. Yeah, that's a myth. Um, instead, most of us experience shock and disbelief and even embarrassment. So most of us don't panic. We kind of think about, oh, God, like, I can't believe I'm lost. I'm going to look like an idiot because I didn't show up on time. Like, it's usually, initially, you think it's re resolvable, right? Um, that whatever you do in the next five, 10 minutes will, will kind of get you back on track. So the initial feel, and this, this is from, again, the interviews with 150,000 you know, people over, you know, years and Robert Coyster. And, um, most people don't freak out right away. The initial reaction is more like embarrassment or again, shock. Um, number two, many people experience an irrational belief that no one is looking for them. When that happens, they don't call out. Some even ignore a helicopter flying overhead. So this is really important. This one is super important, right? That when you're lost, um, that, you know, you, you think, well, yeah, no one's looking for me. Well, yeah, people are looking for you. Like people recognize that you're gone. Um, and especially if you've told people ahead of time, hey, I'm going on, well, when I bike, right? I always let my family know I'm biking this route, which they know. And I expect to be home about this time, you know? So those are two pieces of information, right? And so if anything happens, right, like that typically goes beyond that. I would expect that someone would come out and be looking for me. But that's not the thing, right? Most people believe when they're out and they're lost that people are not looking for them, especially after some typical time that they would normally be, be back. And that's also why they don't call out for help. They're not yelling, help, help, or they're not, um, now I'll go through four ways you can, can get, you know, improve your chances of getting found. It also like a helicopter flying overhead, right? Well, uh, you know, that they're not trying to wave their arms or wave a colorful piece of clothing or something like that. Um, so yeah, this is, this is very important. And th see, this is important for, um, w for educators to know, right? Like most people, but you know, Let's say you have kids or, or Boy Scouts or whatever, kids on a, on a hiking trip or, you know, whatever. Um, but no one is looking for them. It's a good point. Um, Hansel, so Hansel and Gretel, remember Hansel and Gretel? They may have benefited from leaving a trail of breadcrumbs, but it's not a good sign when a lost person leaves a trail of clothing or equipment. Rather, it's an unfortunate indicator of either late stage hypothermia or exhaustion. So this is good to know. I didn't know this. I had, had no idea. But if you're searching for somebody and you start to see, oh, like they left behind their backpack and now they've left behind like a jacket and here's a glove and whatever, 
you're thinking, oh, I'm getting closer to him. Like, maybe these are signs like they're leaving for me. That's not good. Like, when you see that, right, again, statistically, because this is based in science, when people start to do that, um, they are they are into a stage of uh, panic and irrational, you know, thought. Again, late stage hypothermia, exhaustion, and they're just they're just shedding things. So if you see that, like it, it's really a sign we've got to accelerate our search. They're not leaving clues for us. So that's a good thing to know. These are good things to go over with like kids, right? Just kids in general, like at a school assembly to have somebody come in and to talk about this for you know 30, 40 minutes. It's just it's a good life skill to know, like these things. Nobody does it, right? But let's keep going. Number four, 50% of searches resolve in three hours. So, yeah. So half these searches in three hours, person is, is found. Um, doesn't necessarily mean they're found alive, but that they're found. Number five, 54% of people are found within two miles of the point where they were last seen. That's really important. 54. So more than half the people are found within a two-mile radius. A few years ago, we had um, a drowning at a, at a lake in town, which is less than a mile from me. So it, there's a beach, and um, it's a recreational for swimmers, and, and there's some some uh, you know boaters and stuff like that. But um, there was a kid who, a uh, middle schooler who drowned just outside of the the approved area for swimming, and it took um, several days to find his body. I mean, it's a, it's a, a very deep lake. I mean, like 80 to 100 feet, I believe, even though it's like in town it's in, and, and surface wise, it's not a very big lake, but it, it's very deep. And, you know, they, they were bringing in, you know, um, search teams from all over and sonar and whatever. And eventually they, they did found, they found this boy who had drowned, but, um, but, you know, kind of going off this again, um, to spread out a search and rescue. This is something a school might do, right? If you have a student who wanders, a school administrator might say, oh, like, let's try to like, go out, you know, like you go out a half mile here, a half mile there. And it's like, well, the reality is like, try to keep your rescue assets pretty close to where the student was last seen and try to get as much density in that area, like get people out searching in the area you know, 15 feet away from each other and walking that versus like trying to spread people out across like two miles. But like, that's something nobody would know to do. So that's the thing, right? Somebody wanders, like if you had this knowledge ahead of time and say, hey, like, where were they last seen? They were last, we, we know they were like over here. Okay, we're going to like concentrate in this area. You're much more likely to find them than taking and spreading people out. Um, six. Hikers tend to become lost if the trail is obscured, or if they are, if there are confusing trails that intersect. Rescuers, rescuers will do a map and terrain analysis to determine where the confusing spots are, so they can look there first. So yeah, um, the uh, wandering woodsman, um, Cliff does a, a great show on on you know state parks and hiking in general and things like that, and you'll often see in his shows. I mean, he's very, very experienced out in Pennsylvania. But he'll say, like, here's here's markers on a trail. Like, here's what he uses to find. And if he does get in a situation where he's off a trail, not really sure where he is, like, he knows how to likely get back to, like, where a trail would be. So that's the thing, right? Like, a lot of these trails aren't um, maintained really well. They get overgrown. Here's like a trail, but here's like an off-road where like a utility company can like drive down there to, you know, service a couple of poles or something like that. And and that's a th and I, I often wonder this like in cave stuff. And I need to ask Athlon because like I I the nutty putty cave res failed rescue attempt in 2009, there was a man who went in nutty putty cave south of um Salt Lake City and he, he got stuck and he died. A young man, he was struck, he was a uh, studying to be a doctor. And um, the thing was, he went down into an area head first, and then it, it stopped and they couldn't pull him out. Like it was really tight 10 by 18. But my question there is like the Nutty Putty Cave had been around for like, they had been known for 30 years. 
and had other issues where people had to be rescued. Wouldn't you put like markers inside a cave to mark these areas? I was saying like, don't go down here. Oh, and, or like, I don't know. So, but, but yeah, so hikers, so even hikers, right. Who, who might go out to a state park, right. Because we know that 4,000 people a year in, in national parks get lost. They think these, these are marked really well, but it doesn't take long to get off of a trail. Um, or you see like a little side trail, a path that some people have taken to get to wherever and then you take that and you're not sure how to get back. So these are really, this is a really uh, good information, right? Um, hikers. So you can look at a map apparently and, and say, here's where they probably, you know, messed up. But uh, number seven, hunters become lost because they are focused on game rather than navigation or time of day. If caught after dark, the typical hunter will build a shelter, then proudly walk out of the woods unassisted at daybreak. So something too, right? So lost hunters, genuine hunters, right? Are more likely to keep it together and to, to make a decision of, it doesn't make sense for me to try to get out of here like at dusk or whatever. I'm going to stay the night and then I'll try to get out in the morning. I'll see where the sun goes up or, you know, do orientation of myself. So, um, that's typical with hunters. So let's go over to the, to the chat. Great show, doc. It's out to Thanks buddy. You're on top. Yeah. Like this is something people don't talk about. So I'm glad I'm talking about it. And this is a great chat. They can say, keep in mind the helicopter ride was only 30 miles by vehicle. It ended up costing $12,000. So yeah, there is a, a barrier to making a decision or committing assets, right. Of, um, when you know, there's going to be a high cost to rescue and I, nobody talks about that. Um, so number eight, despondent people typically don't travel very far. If suicidal, they hide from search teams. Despondent people are often found at the interface between two types of terrain, such as a cliff or along a shoreline. So somebody, again, suicidal, um, who has gone out into a woods or to an area, it's likely they will be found very close to the air, like if they've left a road, right? It's, it's very... They're not going to go miles and miles into, into a wooded area. So, um, so get how to concentrate your your search effort, and also like you could be ten or fifteen feet from them and, and yelling their name, and they're not going to respond um, to you, right? So it's, that's a really complicated search. Number nine: lost adults will usually stay on a trail. However, they may climb a hill to get a view of the area. They rarely travel in a straight line, and rarely reverse direction. So a couple of good points from there is one is rarely reverse direction. People tend to keep going forward instead of going back. Keep going forward. Thinking like if I just go forward, if I go to the next hill, it's something called simulated annealing, right? I'll be able to maybe have a better set of options available. I can see further. Like I can look down. Oh, there's a railroad track. Okay, now I know where I'm at. Like oh, there's a building down there so I can go to that. So people tend to keep going. Adults, lost adults. And um, they'll look for high points to try to get a view. So that works if you can get a view. It doesn't work if you get to a high point and you can't make out anything. And now you've just expended calories to get to a high point. Plus, you're further away from rescuers. Um, plus, it gets colder the higher you get, right? So number 10, children, on the other hand, look for familiar spots rather than hills. They can't judge either direction or distance and tend to move randomly. So while adults, people with dementia tend to be very linear. So if you, you can plot out 100 yards where they've gone, it's likely they'll keep going in that direction. Kids, you don't know. Again, they go all over the place. Um, things that are familiar, things that are going to attract their attention, big boulder, piece of machinery, stuff like that, like they're going to, to go to that. Um, young people ages 13 to 15 often become lost in groups of two or more. Youth in a group rarely travel very far from where, where they were last seen. So, you know, a group of kids who get lost, they typically recognize they're they're lost and they're going to stay where, at the point where they've got lost. They're not going to be like, oh, let's like break out like each of us and try to find whatever they're going to. Those are the folks that likely hunker down like and they wait for someone to come and rescue. Children ages one to three, so we're talking really young kids, look for the most convenient location to lie down in our as a result, very difficult to detect, a little bit older, four to six. Um, and one of the big problems is they don't answer rescuers because they've been taught to avoid strangers. So you have a four to six-year-old who gets lost. 
somebody is coming in, right? A police officer, you know, that might, you know, people come in, they don't know, they might have a lot of apparel or like bright color clothes. They, they kind of seem intimidating. And again, they might be yelling or even yelling the child's name. And the child is very like apprehensive. Oh, I've been taught to stay away from strangers. I don't know this person. So that's where as a parent, right? Um, you know, telling a child, if you're ever in a situation where you're lost and somebody is yelling your name, right? I guess to go to, the, I guess there's some pitfalls in that too, but um, but yeah. Um, and number it says 12, number 13, berry pickers, nature photographers, and rock hounds are often inadequately clothed or equipped. I've also seen this in people who try to check out caves, um, right? People go in and they don't have any, any gear with them, any water, whatever. And they're like, Oh, I'm going to investigate this cave. And then they, they lose their bearings and hypothermia, right? Especially if they get wet. Rescuers try to put themselves in the lost person's shoes, asking questions, where do the best berries grow? Or I guess if you're a caver, like where would I probably go if I was in this cave? If I was a photographer, what would I try to get pictures of? If I was a rock hound, where would I try to get uh, a, you know, artifact or a, I don't know, whatever I'm looking at. So fossil, right? So out of those 13 things, what are, what are some of the points to take away? The first thing is like the moment most people get lost. Um, they don't panic. They they think it's solvable. They're more embarrassed than anything else. And they think within the next 10, 15 minutes, they'll just figure out where they're at. So the first re reaction, and, and that can be a really bad thing, and we'll learn because once you realize you're lost, you should stop. Stop moving. But um, also people with an irrational belief that no one is looking for them, which can be a real um impact on your morale if you're lost, right? If it's like, oh God, like, you know, I'm out here and I'm on my own and, you know, but, you know, really, no, like once you're out there, I mean, there are other people, you know, who are looking for you. There's a whole network of people and there's, and usually like for, for rescues, you know, there's tens of people, if not hundreds of people out there, you know, looking. So, um, and I think that's a, a big part of keeping your spirits up. Um, I, I learned from this also when people, you know, if I'm, if I'm looking for somebody and I'm like, oh, here's a backpack or, you know, here's a glove and here's a, you know, piece of clothing, here's a bandana. Like if you start to find these things as you're going along, that's a bad sign, right? Because people are in late stage hypothermia or exhaustion, or they're starting to have mental confusion. They're leaving these things. They're not leaving these things. So you find them because if they did that, they would stay in one place and have their bright colored clothing and stuff. So people could, could maybe see those, those things. They're not leaving these things behind. And if they're going to leave markers for themselves, they're probably going to use natural things like stones, you know, to try to mark things or, or you know, break tree branches, stuff like that. Um, let me go out. A um, couple more. Dun, 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 dun. So anyway, I think, I think, you know, so those are big things, big things. So let's get into how to get found here in a moment. But... Old humble. I hate it when 46 year olds get lost. That's young, man. Those are young folk. It's much younger than me. So I was out walking um, last week and I do like an eight mile walk and it takes me out of town to a township. And, and then, uh, and I've got to know a couple of people who live in some like elderly condos or condos like designed for elderly people, I guess. But so like they're usually outside on their lawn chairs and and like so I stop in and I'll say hey how's it going stuff like that and uh, and they would say hey like you you just like question like you're like forty years old like maybe forty I'm like whoa like you're not even in the right decade man no I am I am older than that because they're like well why are you out here all the time like you know don't you have a do you have a job aren't you distilling whiskey I'm like you can't compete with old humble distilling company I'm like I wouldn't even try that It'd be stupid get smashed. But, uh, but yeah, so they're like, no. Um, so all pro Leventon following it, falling in our biking friend. Appreciate it. I'm going to do a bike ride next couple days here. Probably an 80 miler. It's getting uh, late in the season. There's probably six weeks of biking left where I live. Spam bot. Hey, spam bot. You're probably logging in from work here. So be careful, buddy. My mother had a stroke a few years ago. She, can uh, get lost easily now. Sorry to hear that. Yeah. This, so, right. Stroke could, uh, right. Can in introduce that, um, you know, to, to people where they have uh, difficulty orienting. Right. 
I had a, a very good friend. His father fell off a ladder. He was like 70 years old, fell off a ladder, had a traumatic brain injury, and uh, subsequent, subsequently um, wandered from his home very frequently, very fr frequently. And um, his, his, his uh, level of care was increasing. But he was a strong, athletic guy, right? Like he would you know, be able to open a door, get out and walk and stuff like this. And when he was in nursing and rehab centers, like it, he was frequently leaving them. And they, and, and, and so it was a real challenge for the family of where they could even find a place to provide these level of services. Because if he was at home, like his wife was also in her seventies, couldn't restrain him. You know, he'd say, I'm going, like I'm out of here. And, um, and so, yeah, I think sometimes we, we get this impression too, of like an elderly person, like fail and, and feeble, but that's not necessarily the, the case. Um, Olembel saying, I prefer the situation when I know where I am, but nobody else knows where I am. You know, you're not lost, but everyone else lost you. Yes. Bolo, hypothermia, brain function is off. They've got to rescue themselves with all right actions. Yeah, that's something I've learned in studying rescues um, is once, you know, it's like, the, like getting stuck in quicksand, right? If you get stuck in quicksand, it's very unlikely you will drown in quicksand. It's very likely, though, if you don't get yourself out, that you will die of hypothermia in quicksand because the the heat from your body is sucked into the surrounding sand. It's the same thing with cavers. Um, as I was doing more research on um, cave rescues, right? Just kind of interested in this. My friend Athamel Dikwa is a cave rescuer. And is a cave enthusiast himself, but he's also a cave rescuer. You know, one of the big things is like if you're caving and you get wet, like that's really bad because it takes the the heat you know, away from your, your body. And once you have hypothermia set in, um, you know, your, your time limit is really low. So it's probably one of the biggest things too, right? If you are lost, you need to keep yourself dry. And so if the weather you know, starts to rain, like make a makeshift shelter, like put any, you know, clothing, a backpack, whatever you have to like, keep yourself dry. That is a big, big thing. So, um, Bacon is uh, sharing the link out there for Olumbo, so thank you for doing that. I really appreciate Joe at Olumbo, by the way. And Joe, I, I will be on your show, uh, so let's talk soon. And it's really an, it's an honor for me to, to be invited on your show. And I was thinking today, I'm like, you know, knowing Joe has been an, uh, a value add to my life. It's been an enrichment because Joe himself is a great guy. I, I love his channel. And, and by way of Joe, I've gotten to know Lisa, Lisa Linnae, and Lisa is an attorney, and, and Lisa has helped me in my legal classes that I instruct, right? I'll, I'll I ask her some questions and say, hey, like, what is the law of necessity, right? I kind of, I know about it, but I'm going to talk about it, but right, I'm not a lawyer, so what are some things I should just kind of make school administrators aware? And like, she provides, you know, these, these things. She's a really good person. Like, I wouldn't have known Joe or I wouldn't have known Lisa without, um, you know, without being introduced to, to the show. So anyway, Joe's really a great person, as is is Lisa. So if I ever get down to that greater Houston area, and I know the Humble Library has uh, the velocity of information, but um, but yeah, it's a good friend. Swamp Dog Armory is back. So Swamp Dog Armory, who brought us uh, the awareness that Hanks, or if you think of like the casing for a sausage, we're downsized and you just can't get Hanks during this time of inflation and supply shortage. So watch your Hanks, everybody. Welcome back. Um, and then uh, quicksand, that was really something I worried about. Yeah, you know, quicksand, when I was growing up, right, like that was every other like public service announcement was like, don't get caught in quicksand. And if you do like lay out and have like somebody toss you a stick or a rope and and that was, that was a big concern as a 10 year old growing up in, in my era. You know, Joe and I aren't that far away in age, but I mean, like, you thought quicksand was damn near everywhere. So, um, yeah, um, quicksand was crazy. It, was, it reminded me in of something in college. So I think my first or second year in college, I had this, this health and first aid required class. And our instructor for the, for the final exam had, I don't know, like a four-page exam. And like two pages were on snake bites. And I'm like, whoa, where did this come from? Like we covered this in like 10, 10 minutes a month ago in class. 
And I live in Wisconsin where like, it's very unlikely you will encounter a snake. I mean, we have rattlesnakes and water moccasins. Very, very unlikely though. And, um, and yeah, like you had two pages, like, you know, what happens if you get bit by the, you know, you know, yellow lippered lizard, um, you know, whatever, like what out of A, B, C, and D, like what's your next. And I remember afterwards, you know, we were all, everybody in class, like, what's the deal, man? Like, how in the world did this final exam focus on getting bit by a snake? Like, I'm no one is down for that. And I think, I don't know whatever happened. I think there was something where he like either threw out the section or, but it was just really weird, right? I mean, it was, it was completely strange here in, in, in Northern Wisconsin where, you know, I was taking the classes to have a, a four page final exam. And like half of it was on, you know, what to do if you get bit by, yeah, these, these, these various snakes which aren't even, you know, native to the area. I was like, what in the smokes? I've invited you. I can't be on the show tonight, man. My voice wouldn't hold up, but I I will do that soon. And because I'm teaching university courses on the weekend, I kind of have to preserve my voice because when I teach at the university, I'm teaching for eight hours straight. So like in person, and my voice is gone by the end of that, no matter what I do, you know, water, cough drops, whatever. So like 40 hours before then, I am really trying to limit the use of my, of my voice. So, um, well, I'm saying there's a snake in my boot. So snakes, we have, we have, a, we occasionally have a lot of snakes in our backyard. Um, it has to be like mid October and like 75 degrees. You get a day like that and the grass snakes or the garter snakes will come out. And we, we butt up to parkland. It's a wooded area. And, and they come out of there. Like I remember maybe like 10 years ago when my daughters were young, like we had so many snakes in our backyard. It was just nuts. And they're, they're not dangerous, but they're kind of like annoying. Right. So I took a five gallon pail out and we just snake wrangled for like a couple hours and you know, you pick them up. The biggest thing is like they would pee on you or poop on you. So you gotta be kind of careful, but you pick up these one to two foot snakes and put them in the bucket. And then, you know, once they had enough, like I'd run a hundred feet back into the woods and drop them off. Um, but yeah, it was, it was pretty intense. Like, and we still get snake. I mean, it's just not a big deal. Like, it's not like I got a rattlesnake out there that's going to bite me or something like that. It's a snake friendly area. But, um, but yeah, every time this is a swamp. Every time I hear that uh, someone got bit by a snake, I think an Oregon trail. Oh my God, man. I was an Oregon trail junkie in the day back like in the eighties, man. When that, that was out Commodore 64. So I see rattlesnakes all the time. Says he, you know, here's another part of this whole search thing. So like, what do you, the search thing changes, right? Like, if you're in Texas, right? <laughs> if you're somewhere where there's a chance where, you know, just, just getting a search party together and saying, yeah, like, you know, you might encounter a rattlesnake or whatever snake, like, you know, moccasin, like that changes this whole thing too. So that's another part that's missing in how we educate people about, you know, rescues. And stuff. Like up here, you don't really have to worry about it, um, but yeah, it's a good thing. So... Oh my God, Spambot, you have a boa in your house. 2.2 meters long and 40K of muscle. So, wow. Um, so I'm like saying, depending on where you're growing up in Texas, there's a lot of spiders. Yeah, it's another thing, right? Spider scorp. So it's, it's really good. And that's why I'm glad like Lisa's chiming in on this whole law of necessity because like what does it look like if you send staff out to in a, in a texas school right to search for a student they get off property and they're stung by a scorpion like who's responsible to pay the the medical bill for that right like what what is what's the deal or you know if you do have a rescue is there certain rescue gear you should have on hand that you're wearing like special boots or like boot gaiters i don't know like this is a good question i don't know this so um, water moccasins here, not so much. Yeah, I've I've seen a few around here, but not much. Um, you know, here we have timber rattlers, but it's pretty rare unless you're really out, like hiking and looking looking for it. I mean, which I'm not. When I hike, it's usually 
they're hibernating by the time I'm hiking. And otherwise in summer I'm biking. And I don't know, I saw, I, you know, I see a lot of pine snakes on the road and grass. A pine snake can be, you know, like six to eight feet long. Um, but otherwise, you know, not a big thing up here. So uh, how to get found? What do you do? What do you do if you're lost? Like what, what's some advice now? Again, like I understand that there has to be like, you have to be aware that you're lost. So if a kid, a kid with autism, you're lost, you're probably going to be aware that if a person with autism or a person with dementia, you're not going to be aware of these things. But what if, what if you have the presence to understand like, Oh, I'm lost. What should you do? And, uh, Oh, by God, subscribe to this channel. We had 1,197 subs going into tonight, which is great. We're almost up to 1200. We are uh, less than a thousand hours away from getting monetized. So if you can log into this show on your 12 different YouTube channels, subscribe from your 18 different YouTube channels and watch this. I appreciate it. 184 shows out there. Go back and check out the interview with Larry Lawton or Robert Travis. Or the one I did with Justin Dooley, man, that's one for the ages. Go and check those out. So we are going to get into what did what to do if you're if you're lost. Excuse me, how to get found. So and uh, so we're going to get to that in one minute. A must read for parents, teachers, and taxpayers. Dr. David Perodin has written the most honest book about the $3 billion school safety industrial complex. Attorney James Sibley proclaims, A brave demonstration of speaking truth to power, School of Errors rips the lid off the billion-dollar school safety industry. Using real-world examples of successful responses in desperate situations, David contrasts the expensive window dressings pitched to panic parents with the inexpensive and effective approaches proven to actually work. Read this book before you let your school waste another precious dollar on meaningless safety theater. Buy the international bestseller, School of Errors, Rethinking School Safety in America, now at Barnes & Noble or Amazon. Now at Barnes & Noble or Amazon. So it's also available in ebook. It's also available in audiobook for $7.99 from downpour.com and a number of sites. Um, $7.99, I narrated it, and um, so it's six hours long. But uh, if you go on Audible, you can get it, but they charge more. It's just the way that it is. And if you have an Audible subscription rate, it's less. But if you go to downpour.com, um, if I could find this or someone could find the link, if you go on downpour.com and type in School of Bears, you can find it. And it downloads like any MP3, right? $7.99. That will go up after August 31st. You have two days to download the audiobook, um, School of Bears, narrated by me. So it's a, it's a great narration. Doc really gets into it. So somebody post that on downpour, if you wouldn't mind, as I try to look it up myself. Downpour. It's, it's out. It's on a lot of sites, but again, if you, I'll, that's the thing with audiobooks, right? Is there are certain sites that add their own markup and I do get a percentage of that. Um, but you know, it's kind of, it's not why I put it at seven ninety nine. So here it is. Somebody do it right now. Be that person. Be that all star, and uh, so I can actually see on my interface if it shows up tomorrow. God, gosh, bless it. Here it is. Let's make that as the. Uh, uh, let me let me do this. Let's let's put that up there as the post it. Uh, Right, let's put this as the uh, pin message. Done. Done. All right, I got it. All right, so we're going to talk about four. Um, well, anyway, let me, let me do this at the stream. So this is what it looks like from downpour.com. Now, again, it's audible, it's out there, Barnes and Noble, all these places, but $7.99, which is what I priced it at. The other places tend to increase it. Um, and yes, this is different than this because the cover of an audiobook, um, 
isn't necessarily covered under the copyright of the audiobook. Like the publisher paid for the this cover. So School of Airs is a cover where I own the rights to that cover. So anyway, same book, same word for word, same book. But uh, there it is, School of Errors. So dun da da dun da 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 da. All right. Anyway, let's get out of there. Be, you could be the person though. Like I could log in tomorrow morning and be like, "Oh my God, it was downloaded off a downpour." Thank you, Swamp Dog Armory. So um, Swamp is saying that's one of the things I'm mentioning on this week's channel update show is the new. Via, I'm guessing virtual rea virtual reality survival self reliance skill building videos that are going to be coming out. So, and if I'm if I'm if VR stands for something else, like you know, let me know. Um, but that's really that's good. You know, the, and we and we I talk about this in the velocity information. Right, we get this whole thing of like offloading, like thinking we go to an app and like that lost person app. Like if if you're interfacing with that the first time when someone is actually lost, like it'll make no sense to you at all. You'll be freaked out and not able to use it. So you got to know your assets at a time and practice using them. So what are, what are things you can do to help improve your chances of getting found? So here's the first thing. Stop. Stop. As soon as you realize you may be lost, stop, stay calm, stay put. Um, because right. Like, the more people travel, if they're lost, they tend to not go back. Even if they know where back is, they tend to go forward. So you go further away from rescuers. So just stop because people are looking for you. People will find you. Stop. So that's the first thing. Stop. Um, number two, think. So, so go over in your mind and be like, okay, what landmarks should be around me? right like and if you have a reason to move like if you passed something a little bit ago and you're like oh, here's this big boulder or here's like whatever it was a sign that, that i remember like then there's a reason to to take the next step but if there's not a reason to take a next step then just like stay where you're at so think like is there anything recently i've passed that would be a landmark right pretty obvious like there's a big boulder there's like an old car like the people come out in the woods to check out and old truck that's all rusted out Railroad tracks, you know, whatever it is. Flying saucer, I don't know about that, but observe. If you're on a trail, you don't know where you're at, just stay on the trail because people will, search, searchers will go on the trail. So stay on a trail. Don't try to like cross cut and say, oh, like I think like my car is a mile that way, but I have to like go through all this thicket and stuff like that. By the way, I was like cleaning my, as I was working in my yard today for eight hours, there's an incredible amount of like prickly thicket in my at the end of my property that goes into parkland. I had to pick all of that stuff off the bag on my leaf back. Like those little little sticky things that, that get on there. Didn't stick on my pants. It's all canvas. But the bag, man, I had to spend like 30 minutes of my time dealing with that. Um, so, observe, so yeah, if you're on this trail, just stay on it. Like, don't try to cross cut. If you have a whistle, a whistle, like, right, a, a whistle's a buck. If you're if you're hiking, carry a whistle. If and then blow three times because that's the international distress signal. Like three times, you know, try to do it for three seconds each time, like just like that. So you whistle and then you know take a break or whatever. Then a minute later you're doing it again. But like a whistle travels a long distance and people will recognize that three. I mean, res res people searching for you, if they hear like three consecutive blasts of a whistle, they'll recognize that's somebody in distress. So you bring a whistle. Like it's really, it's a, it, sh it should be on a keychain. It should be on the back of your backpack or whatever and things like that. So you're probably going to, you won't see this right with kids necessarily who wander, although you could include it on a backpack, but with the kid use it or, you know, somebody with dementia. But if you're a hiker or whatever, like you're going out, like bring a whistle. Absolutely. So I actually have a whistle around the corner from my office here, and it's up on the it's up on the wall, on a little lanyard. And you know, the thought is, if we were ever in, I think one of my daughters brought home from school or whatever. But the thought is, like, right, if there was a tornado, like the top of the house gets ripped off or whatever, like we'd be able to use that to you know signal that you know we are we are still here. Or like you could grab the whistle um, if you had 
to, you know, let people know that you were here probably after a, a significant disaster, right? I don't know, but, um, but anyway, it's like a buck, right? So, um, hey, welcome to the bit. Welcome, buddy. So, Bacon is saying to Bolo, hey, um, how many people do you know can start a fire even out of the tools? So true, right? So, you know, just even, you know, the hiking thing. I, I see this a lot when I watch more and more videos about, like, um, not necessarily hiking, but um, about people who get lost in caves. Like, they just have no idea what to bring with them. But I suppose it's hiking, too. Like, people just don't know what to bring with them. Like, again, I, I brought... You know, when I learned biking, and I'm like, I'm not biking off road, like, you know, I'm biking on roads and it's pretty obvious. And I mean, even if my something happened catastrophic to my bike, I mean, I'd be able to walk to some form of residence or place of business. But, um, you know, I learned over the years, though, right, like how my body reacts to biking for 80 miles or something like that. Like what I have to bring along, bananas and a salt tablet and how I bring along things to keep my electrolyte balance. And, you know, by doing those things that you don't cramp up, but, um, you know, it can be a really serious thing, especially if you're you're out and people aren't aware where you're at and your body starts to, to kind of give out on you because you haven't brought the appropriate things. And right, I always pack, like, I always know the weather, but, you know, if there's anything iffy, like I always bring, you know, like an extra insulated shirt with me, that's always in my, my bag, like full of towns, so. Um, but, uh, this is, uh, Heath piecing. I'm 3D printed some dog whistles. You can attract rescue dogs fashion. So that's interesting too, right? Heath? So it's a good point. Um, so it's really, it's really a good point. Um, bacon saying I did, I actually did not know three whistle burst was an international code for help. Learn something. Well, thanks, Bacon. Yeah, that is known. So whether it's like three long bursts or like if you make three noises, tapping three rocks together, like one, two, three, and then pause for like a minute and one, two, three. Like the pattern of three is an international sign um, of distress. So yeah, that is any way you can make, any way you can make noise, right? The pattern of three is an international sign of distress. Uh, this is from Swamp Dog Armory. I've been curious if the old poppers that we used to make in school out of folded paper might be useful in survival situation. I'm going to make some and test. Inter I remember those, man. I don't know. It's a good question, man. Be good for a show. So, um, my dad's hearing rage can't hear the frequency. This is Bolo of my whistle anymore, but at least, at least I can hear. Like any whistle, though, like a, a rescue whistle. I would think, I mean, I'm a speech language pathologist. I would think that would still be in a in your range of hearing, even if you had hearing loss. Um, so, so, so what we're going, how to get found. Stop if you're lost. Most people will try to keep going forward instead of going backwards. Stop. Go over in your mind if you're close to a landmark, like if you believe, you know, I just passed, I think I just passed the sign or something. That gives you a reason to maybe move, but if you can't think of, any reason to move, then don't move. Observe, if you're on a trail, you're likely to be found. Don't try to like go off a trail. Blow that whistle three times. Number four is planned. Inventory your options. This is called simulated annealing. Sit down and say, what do I have? What do I have on me? What What's my clothing situation? You know, do I have something, something in a backpack? Or if it gets cooler, what do I have for food, water, um, what, how do I feel like physically, right? Like, am I getting exhausted? Inventory your options and then decide. It's all simulated kneeling. Um, if you can make a decision to get you possibly to a better outcome. So the question there is like, okay, like there's a hill. Like if I get on the hill, I have a, a better line of sight. I can see more things, maybe see where I'm at or in myself, see railroad tracks down below a road or something I can aim aim toward like right that increases my chances of being found so maybe that's an option like if you're kind of you know you know earlier a couple hours into your your trip right your your hike or whatever um you have a lot of energy 
you know, you feel well and, and things like this. But again, like we know you're probably going to hike further away from where rescuers would come and get you. But just to this whole thing of simulated kneeling, what are my options? Um, or, you know, are my options to stay here? I have a brightly colored, like when I bike, I also have in my bike bag a, well, on the back of my bike, I have a yellow triangle, which is a cloth yellow triangle for visibility, but it it's Velcro. So I can detach it if I ever had to go mobile. Plus I yell like a, I have like a neon shirt. So like a pretty easy to find, I guess. But, um, but yeah, like, could you, if you have something, something bright, like, could you, could you set it up? So it's upward facing, you know, what are some things that you could do around you to, to make it, make you more visible. And again, like, you know, that you could either blow a whistle or bang rocks together three times or like, Hey, you know, peer every minute or every five minutes, like, yeah, like, Hey, like I'm lost, like whatever, you know, those type of, of things. Um, so let me go over to the, the, we've had a great chat. So thank you so much. Um, so I'm sorry, three, anything, three flashes of light. Yeah. Three shots from a gun, three whistles, three arrows, anything, right? Three is I'm lost. I need help. So three is, is the indicator. Um, so yeah, three, and you'll, you'll find this after hurricanes, right? Pe uh, searchers going house to house, like, um, after the, um, the attack on uh, Pearl Harbor in 1941, you know, like soldiers tapping three times with a hammer or whatever on a, on the hull, like three times, that is a rescue signal. And that separates you out from the noise, right? Of just like periodic tapping or like a loud bang or whatever, like you might make, but three taps, right? So know that. So it's good bacon, you know, that they've got that. Um, me, air horn, see, if you're actually, you know, hiking, right? There are things you can, can probably bring with you that I would recommend. Um, so I'm talking, there's, there's so many origami things that can be useful to survival. It, I don't know, man, that'd be, that would be an awesome show. I once could make an origami um, shirt with a collar out of a dollar bill. I no longer have that ability. It's pretty awesome. I think I, I actually, let me, let me see here. I think I actually have it. This is, this is worth it if this actually happens. Jeez, what is this? Hang on. So this is a $1 million bill, by the way. Man, oh, man. Take this to the bank, Doc. Will, Doc will be set. Good times. All right. This is pretty disheartening because my... Uh... Hang with me. Wait, don't, don't leave. All right, this is the last place it would be. Holy smokes, man. Here's my Sam's Club membership. Now I'm going to put my, my, uh, I guess the identifying information is on the back of this, but, uh, that's my Sam's Club membership from 30 years ago. Yeah. Looks like the first day I was out of prison. It's insane. Marathon Bowling Center. So, um, it's a picture of me about, uh, I don't know, I guess there's a date on here. In 1999 in Rapid City with a, uh, rescue a brush truck so what in the world huh hang on all right this just doesn't look favorable Well, that's disappointing because I have no, I have no idea where that dollar is. Um, but yeah, I folded a dollar, so it looked like a, uh, kind of like a polo shirt with a collar. So it's pretty good. Sorry, got me. I was, couldn't do it today, and I'm out a dollar because I know I saved it. Um, Egg Rice is saying, I "Often sneeze in threes. The missus can always find me." Except I have a loud sneeze. 
Um, Bolo saying mood is key. Hydration makes a difference. Yeah, that's one thing, right? Mood, if you know other people are looking for you, and you, you tell people ahead of time, right? Like this is an important show for people to know this because a lot of people think, oh, I'm screwed. Like no one's out there looking for me or they're not going to know where I'm at. It's not that, it's not as hard today as it was years ago because people have drones. They generally know where you are. They can ping your device, stuff like this. So, um, but bringing water is is a big dip, is a is a game changer. When I bike, a gallon of water is eight pounds. So when I well, I take two gallons of water, but like one is a gallon of water, and then the other gallon is spread out across like four bottles. But um, you know that's a commitment, man, to to take like sixteen pounds of water on a bike trek. But um, you know, and I, I typically drink through I would say like eighty percent of my water while biking. But I would much rather have the water than not to have the water. So that that was a lesson learned, right? <laughs> and not really expensive to fill up a gallon jug of water um, and not use it. Actually, when I get home, if I don't use it, I take the gallon and I we have two flower planters toward the front of the garage and I just pour it out in both of those. Bacon saying to Heath, good reminder, have one from when I was biking to work and back when I first moved here. Don't know if that's a chainsaw, if that's a whistle or a sword. Swamp Dog Armory is saying, you'll be good. Don't forget to hit the like and the yeah, do that. Um, so I would please subscribe. The channel has 1,197 subscribers. I'd love to get above 1,200. I'd love to log in one day and be above 12Q or 12K. And then... Um, or not 12K, 12K would be 12,000, 1,200. And then, yeah, watch the show, share the show on your other social media platforms because it's the point where we're getting closer to monetization. Like we're less than 1,000 hours, which is really exciting. And there's a lot of really cool shows out there. So I appreciate that. And hitting the, hitting the like button. By the way, I did a great interview earlier this week on John Crump Live, or, or last week, I should say. And that one uh, has gathered a lot of views, but that's on the Safer Communities built an hour long where I'm like, here's what it means for schools. And it's not all as good and rosy as what they say it is. Is my good friend CNT. You know, there's a space in back me over there where CNT is working on something for that area. It's right back there. That plaque is going to have to be moved. I'm going to have to rearrange things, which I'm willing to do because CNT has got something in the works the back here for the safety doc podcast like all of the all of the walls are really well done this is my self western wall which i you know, finished up last week is painted and got the paintings so like this is the covers of the book and two by three footprints and stuff like that over here it's really cool but in back me like that's it's got space back there so cnt designs is working on something um so appreciate that after the show leave a comment and comment yeah i appreciate that I've been doing that more for shows that I appreciate. Like I, I think yesterday I posted like seven, eight comments because comments, right. Help. Um, they, they just help. watch hours, comments, all those things. You guys know at the safety. That was a great show. Yeah. Thanks buddy. That was really, I would, I, that was my best interview of 2022 when I was on John Crump live. And, you know, part of that is, you know, Rich is phenomenal and John, and we talked ahead of time. So like we had it all planned out of what I would talk about. And um, it, it, we covered a lot of ground in 60 minutes about how the safer communities bill will impact schools, what it means. And then also some crazy stuff of like, what is going to be like available or, or sought for records requests if a 18 year old student tries to purchase a firearm, right? Like now school records become involved, which they never were in the past. And no one has any idea what this means. And that's a, that's a crazy stuff, right? But anyway, go to that John Crump Live. If anyone wanna, wants to post that out, that was last week, John Crump Live. I was on, I did an hour interview with John and with a Flying Rich. So it was, I, I think it was, it was the best interview I did of 2022. I, I appreciate those two guys to the hilt. Um, so this is Swamp Dog. I know people already mentioned interest in the drinking straw spice packets for camping. Survival. Yeah, the drinking straw, right? I mean, so if you're, if it, and so these are people who are actually, you know, going to take on hiking or things like that, to have the drinking straw and spice packets, for five, things that you should have with you. So spice straws, which makes sense, right? Um, really good stuff. CNT, by the way, so here's a, here's a link to uh, CNT Coop. So 
that guy is really talented. Holy smokes. Like, I look at these, you know, guys with uh, CAD and 3D printers and, and uh, plasma cutters and stuff like that. And holy smokes, man. I'm like, that is some awesome stuff that they are that they are doing. So, so let's keep going here. So we talked about 13 behaviors of, or 13 facts of missing people, how to get found. And, and I, an obvious one, right, is if you stay put to try to make yourself visible. So if you have some visible article of clothing, but like to not leave it behind, right? But like with you or kind of clear out that area or to, to you know, even stack some stones or whatever. And if someone is like flying overhead to like wave your arms and things like that. Um, so, you know, those types of things. So here's a question that uh, I find frequently, or I found frequently as I started to do this case study for my fall superintendent class. And is it okay to trespass when searching for a lost person? Well, the question, is, I guess the answer is you're, you're still trespassing. Um, so if you're if you're like a school principal and saying, hey, we're in a rural district, we just called 911 and like we're looking for kid, you know, the kid, but like the police or fire haven't arrived yet. And we're off campus and we're onto somebody's property. Is it okay to trespass? Well, you're still trespassing, right? But this is an issue and this is what people don't talk about. Some people won't do this. I've had superintendents that have told me straight out, if we have to go off school grounds to do the rescue, we are not doing it until police or fire around are available and they are the instant command leader, straight up. And those are usually people who got burned in the past from, you know, taking the lead on something. But uh, so let's say it's a, a school principal. It could be an assisted living center. The assisted living center or, or the nursing home that I worked at when I was um, early in my career was out in the middle of nowhere. Like it was literally just, a, and I talked about it in school of airs. I wrote about like this fire approaching. I mean, it was easily 10 minutes away from people responding. Right. So can you trespass? The question is you're still trespassing. It comes into this thing of called the law of necessity, which I'll do a show on with Lisa. Um, Lenny. So the law of necessity is like things you'll never hear about in your superintendent classes. Like I mean, this, this is a great breakout session, right? And I've seen people burned by the law of necessity also. And I'll talk about that. Um, the law of necessity is basically saying um, it's, so it's a legal defense saying your honor, the fact finder, right? Whoever is the judge or the district attorney or whatever in this case saying, say, and it supplies in both criminal and common law. The necessity definition in law is a defense that arises when a person is forced to break the law in an emergency situation to prevent a greater harm from occurring. So, you know, one instance I read about, about was uh, um, a kid who was 16 years old and it was night and you can only drive for so long with your license when you're 16. And he observed somebody swerving in front of him that he assumed was um, impaired with alcohol or drugs or something. So he called 911 and said, hey, I'm like behind someone and they're, they're all over the road. And the 911 operator, you know, person said, okay, we are, you know, sending law enforcement, um, but continue to follow this person and stay on the line and tell us like what they're doing. So this 16 year old did that. And by the time law enforcement pulled over the person who actually was drunk driving, um, the law enforcement law, law enforcement person also um, fine gave a fine to the 16 year old kid and said you're out after hours you can only drive until 10 p.m and it's like 10 30 and the kid's like hey like 911 told me to follow this kid this guy and like if I wasn't following him and giving a report like maybe he could have you know gone off somewhere and killed some people right or you know collision or something like I I helped you get here and stop this person so Part of that then, so he he was written a ticket. He went to the court and he said, you know, it's a law of necessity, right? Like, yeah, I had to be out past 10 o'clock, but I was preventing hopefully this guy from killing himself or killing others or seriously injuring them because he was impaired. Now, when the police came in, right, the police just said, we gave the kid a ticket. He was out after 10. And then when the, when the the kid asked, you know, the court told the judge, like, I was told, you know, I was following someone who was drunk and whatever. And, and then they asked the police, was this person impaired when you tested? And the, and the officer said, yes, I had like a 1.1, you know, percent blood alcohol level. Well, then, you know, the 
judge dismissed it and said this was the law of necessity. You know, this this person, this 16 year old was doing this to because um, this was an emergency, right? They were they were the greater likelihood of, of risk here was that this person was going to harm themselves or others because they were driving impaired. So the law of necessity is like, can I trespass because I'm trying to find a student with autism who's wandering? And maybe it's like cold outside, right? Especially these, these things that factor into it, or there's a river, or you know, there's whatever it could be, but especially if it's a kid. Um, and so typically that would be your defense, but not everybody is going to agree with that. Not every fact finder, not every district attorney is going to go with that. So there's also this part of, does your district have your back? Does your school board actually have a policy saying, like, if you are acting in what you deem as the best interest of the student, the district will use full force of whatever to back and defend you? Like, a lot of districts don't have policies like that. Most don't. I tell my superintendents, you need to get this in policy. Like, if you're making decisions which are kind of on the fly, high stakes calls, which you will be making as a superintendent, and this is one of them, you need to know that the, the organization has your back right? Because I mean, all this stuff forensically after the fact can get real picky. Oh, like, you know, you walked over whatever, or you damaged somebody's like, you know, it's no offense when you're looking for this kid. Yeah, I get it. But we're looking for a lost kid, right? Or like someone was there and they've, they slipped on some ice and, you know, broke an elbow. So who's responsible for that? I mean, you can get into a lot of contingencies. And, I, and then I lead people back to School of Errors, Rethinking School Safety in America and say, read the chapter on Admiral Loy and the 9-11 rescue, uh, where Admiral Loy uh, um, told, went out over Coast Guard Radio and said, hey, if you have a boat, come down to lower Manhattan and rescue people. 500,000 people rescued in nine hours, no lawsuits. So, you know, I, I think we need to be overt upfront with people on some of the stuff with the rescue right? Like in understanding the law of necessity. And again, it's not going to always work for you, but you have to know your organization's position on some of these things. Are they going to, are they going to back you or not? Um, and I don't think that's too much to ask. So again, um, a child is wandering, a child with autism wanders from your school. They're 10 years old. And, you know, there's a woods in back and you think they've been, that's likely where they were last seen. It's next to the playground. Um, and there's a river not too far from that. When I worked at the school for the blind, my God, there was like a major river an eighth of a mile from the school. I mean, I think you could see it from where the school is located. But, um, so like was, would law of necessity apply? Like, could you go and, and, and trespass? Could you make that argument? So again, nobody, nobody has these conversations, right? Like outside of like doc and, and these are where organizations really let down school administrators, really let these folks down. Because you see a conference and it's all about, you know, the flowery stuff of just schools or whatever, right? Or the obvious school safety stuff. And no one kind of gets into the weeds in this stuff, which is really important. Who has discretion? Who has the ability to allocate, commit resources? And do you have their back? Um, so... But anyway, it's a legal defense. Lisa Lenny and I will be talking about, Lisa will be largely talking about it on a show within the next couple of weeks. Of, of, it's good to know just in general, right? Like, what is what does this look like? Um, and then there's also an interface with the Good Samaritan Law. Lisa brought up to me and said, you know, she's, she's going to take it in both directions. So I can tell you right now, you're listening to this, if you're a school leader, nobody has ever told this to you ever. People in my classes will hear this. We will go through this in detail in case study. You will know this in and out. You will know task your board. Right now, each of you, you can go to your school that nobody has talked about this. Nobody's talked about this in the assistant living centers and nursing. So whatever, daycares, 4Ks, things like that. Anyway, law of necessity. Um, but do schools train, do schools train or practice for law students? So I'm going to get into that right after I go back to the, the thread here. CNT burned in the past or not, you go and find a lost person. Seconds count. Right. Um, what was that? Uh, Billy Madison looking for the dog, right? Get out there and you find a dog. No, you're absolutely right, CNT. Like there, there really should be no question to apply your professional discretion if you are in a position of leadership, because being in a position of leadership 
ready implies like that you have the the ability the given to you to make these decisions. Um, that is with you. So um, you know you need to be able to make those calls. Uh, but but you're right. Like I I will go through and historically like I have all the records. You know, um, administ and this isn't a fault on administrators. Like this this like school administrators. This, this is this is pervasive across leadership positions. Um, Fifty percent of people will say, yeah, I'm going to go out there and I'm going to find that person, right? Or I'm going to like get together a group and we're going to find that person. Um, and 50% will say, no, we will wait for rescuers, whatever, to arrive. And then like if we are deputized by the rescuers and does some rescue for us, like we will, we will act. So, and, and ultimately like I have to come to some point when I teach these things and say, here's what I would do. Like, you know, I would get out there like, once I knew my assets, like I'd inventory those really fast, but like someone shows up with a drone, you know, and they're like, Hey, I live a, a block away and I heard this on the police radio. Like I can have this drone up and I have like this, you know, iPad it's connected to and I'm like, get it flying. So right. Seconds matter. All right. Forensically, there will be people who will roast you. They will just cook you for that, man. They will just hammer you. Um, so let's say like, you know, you, you have someone that helps out, right. And, they wouldn't pass a, a um, background check to get into your school. Um, there's something, and you're like, oh, like this person who participated in a rescue and had their drone or whatever, had this whatever offense that wouldn't even allow them to be a volunteer to school. The media is going to spin that. Then your school board has to have a backbone and step up for you and say, garbage. This We used resources. Like this person wasn't out there individually, like, you know, whatever on their own. They were with, you know, school staff were using their, their you know, piece of equipment. Like that's where Larry Lawton, America's biggest jewel thief would say, you know, that you want to judge people by what they can offer kind of in the moment to you. Like there is this, there is this whole aspect where we dismiss a lot of people. We, we, we try to vet. I understand that, right? But again, you're in the moment. Someone has a drone that can, you can have a school staff standing next to them. Like you're not doing a background background check on that person. But yeah, like people hesitate at this because they're like, I could lose my job, Dave. Like, you know, what if I had a sexual offender, right? Who showed up and I had no idea. And then the next day in the, the news, it's like sexual offender participates in student rescue or searches for student. Could you imagine that as a headline? That's where your board has to have the backbone to stand up for you in your organizations. This is what really fires me up because like they don't. So another thing on... I shouldn't say they don't. Sometimes they don't. I have, um, I'm aware of a, of a person in my state. I talked to them uh, who's an, a, a school leader, right? A school administrator uh, a couple of years ago. They they were going down a hallway um, as a rural school, right? There's not a lot of administrators or whatever. Um, students, two students were fighting. It was very aggressive. And this staff member um, separated those two students because the staff member judged that um, you know, the, this was a very violent fight, like, you know, right there were, so what's typically supposed to happen in our state is that you call for your nonviolent crisis team or your crisis response team or whatever you call it to, to respond to a situation like this. And never really are they supposed to put hands on a student. Although like there is some language, like if there's a, a there could be harm to somebody else or harm to the student, right? You know, like. Um, but here's the deal. Here is the deal, right? Like this guy who intervened and separated these two students by the end of the day, law, the parent of one of these students had said this principal or superintendent or, you know, whatever role he was in, um, that he engaged in battery by grabbing my son and, and pulling him away from this other student and taking him off to the side, like putting hands on this as an act of battery. The police filed a claim of battery. This, this administrator was put on leave. And um, in my state, and I talked to this guy who was put on leave and like for the whole year while they went through like, well, was it, um, and people in my state and uh, principals have been fired because of this. They've been separated from employment and fired because they come in and, you know, um, because of, right, trying to separate. And, and, and they said, by the time I would have called the team and what the team, what are they supposed to do? Like a multi-person hold and all this stuff. But, um, and they said, I thought it was seconds. Like I thought if this kid took another hit to the head, like they could be have permanent brain damage damage. The boards did not back them. 
the, this law of necessity, right, didn't take effect. The Department of Public Instruction in our state, oh, like it's seclusion and restraint and all that, and they would back off of it. They didn't jump in. And like these people just get put on an island. The boards separate out with their legal counsel of saying, well, protect the board and, and everything else. But like this person's on their own. Like they technically should have called the team. And maybe, if, but again, this person is saying, I used my professional discretion. Like I was there. I felt I had the bil- ability to, to, intervene and usually when they intervene like the situation ended they brought a conclusion to it which didn't increase harm to the parties involved but then the state chickens out on it and the school board's chicken out on it and the administrative team chickens out on it and their legal counsel quickly says well it's better if you just separate employment with this person because they violated the state whatever the seclusion and restraint and i'm saying there are instances where you have to act you can't wait around Right. I mean, there were instances you'll come around a corner. Right. And, and again, as this administrator I was talking to you face to face talking to said, Dave, I felt that, you know, in the moment I could separate safely separate these two students. The, the administrator was larger than both of these two students. And, you know, and it felt he he could separate these two students. And if that would have continued for 10 seconds longer, there could have been the potential for some serious lasting harm. And uh, anyway, I don't know the whole story beyond that. I know this person was put on leave for largely like a year, but they're like, you know, my name's in the paper. Like, where am I going to go for a job after this? And it was horrible. And again, this is where the law of necessity needs to be very explicit. Um, And also like how it applies with your your board of education, how it applies with... um, usually the states with seclusion and restraint application from the Department of Public Instruction. Um, And it didn't, it didn't make any, it had no impact. And I've seen it with other administrators in my state. It's had no impact. They're done. Boom. So, right. Like, are you supposed to always like walk around with this team of three other people who are on your crisis response team or, you know, it gets to be pretty crazy um, it, in these situations. Like, because if you don't act right and the student, you know, levels a punch and a student has traumatic brain injury with lasting effects, you're liable, right, for for not intervening. And, you know, even though if you call your non, nonviolent crisis team or whatever you call it, right, that comes on your crisis response team and it takes them 60 seconds to start to show up on the scene, right, which would be reasonable. Um, so, so these are the questions up front. If you get into any situation where you're a leader, especially where you're going to be working in with, with kids or with people or adults or hospital or whatever, like you need an answer to this up front. What is, what's the expectation? So yeah, every, yeah, I remember I met with this administrator a couple of times, um, as a few years ago. And the guy was just like, what do I, younger than I am, I feel really bad. I was just trying to give him some advice. I'm like, you know, what's your state organization doing? Nothing, right? They, they're not going to do anything for him. Um, he's saying, I can't apply for a job. You know, he's, he was getting paid as this kind of worked its way out. And the district decided what legal stuff they were going to to try to do. And, and but, you know, this is, to me, this was a person who acted in the best interest of the student at that moment. The law of necessity was was applicable and and they got toasted. And there are a lot of people I know like that, a lot of people. And there's no coming back from that. Um, you're done. You're absolutely cooked as an administrator if that happens. You will never work anywhere again. Um, let's go over to the chat. Dun, dun, dun. Um... This is from our good fr- good friend, CNT. CNT Design and Arms. When lives are on the line, you act. Um, uh, you do what your school sets can cover, right? Yeah, that would make sense, <laughs> right? You know, we live in a world that has become kind of nonsensical. And I, I, I find myself talking about this more and more with people, especially when I teach my classes. I'm like, yeah, in the real world, not serving a student uh, you know, with educational services for four months during the pandemic because your school is closed, like you'd have to make those up. That'd be compensatory. But like no one is 
holding district's feet to the fire on that, like nowhere. So like, there's a lot of stuff here, like, you know, records requests of public entities and stuff like that, that aren't being carried forward. Like when the, the laws aren't really working anymore, district attorney, the fact the judges, fact finder, like no one's holding people's feet to this or they're charging a big fee to just make them go away. It's like, well, I'm not going to pay that. Um, Bacon to Bolo. Perhaps I imagine most people in that scenario would follow them like they're carpooling. Tailing is a skill. CNT design. Safety doc is 100%. Thanks, buddy. Yeah. You know, and this is the thing, and this is where, by the way, honestly, School of Errors gets into all of this. I mean, this was, when I when I published this book, I knew it was the last, that the day it came out would be the end of my ability to work as a school administrator. At least, I, I have like a lot of stuff. I do 1099 and contracts. You know, I, I, I was to that point in my career where I was like exiting out of that. But I'm like, people need to know there is a truth resource out there. And that is that is a truth resource. Um, so, yeah. Um, CNT is saying, Hey, too many rules that are to try and prevent. Yeah. You know, about 15 years ago, maybe 20 years ago, um, my perception was that a lot of people were very, um, adverse to lawsuits. I mean, I mean, people still, right. But it would be something that would be at the front burner. Like if I do this, will I get sued? And then I don't think people think that much and had thought that much anymore until like right now. It's really coming back strong in the school setting. And I see that because I've taught, you know, hundreds, if not thousands of students over the last 20 years. And now it's something that's moved to the forefront of, you know, and and I think they, it happened during the pandemic, you know, can I be sued because like our school is masking or not masking? And there, there were numerous lawsuits in my state and then individual superintendents being s- named in these suits and stuff like that. And, um, but yeah, I, I think, I think it's returned, CNT. I, I think it's back of, of these people. And that's where, as a school administrator, for example, or you know, you, you need to know where your board of education lies on this stuff. Or you need to have an individual policy for errors and emissions for a couple million dollars that then you're reimbursed by your board of education. Like these things need to happen because your organizations are gonna bail on you on this. And um, you know, the um and, and the Board of Education is going to be protected by their legal counsel. They'll separate out from you. Um, but they'll say, wow! CNT, the cops and DA should refuse to... Yeah, they should, but, right, they sometimes don't, and especially these small communities, you know. So you just don't know. You 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 really don't know what's going to how things are going to play out. That's why you have to and know the board is your back. You have to be very well documented what you do. Um, so I really help people through that. <laughs> I'm like, I when you're done with the classes with me, you will have a very robust circle of protection around you or defense, like a pr- paper trail and all of, all of those types of things. That even if something like this happens, right? So that I, I talked about that school leader who came around a corner, saw these two students in this very aggressive fight, separated them. He then was separated from his access to school email, all of his school stuff. Like he couldn't remember the last day he might have participated in training, the last day, like his his response team. He had none of that. So he was also, um, so that was something, you know, we talked about. And that's something I share with my new ministers. Like you keep a record of all of this. And that record is with you. It's not like, it's some site where you can just be toggled off of by some organization. Bolo's saying, I'm so glad high school's 30 years ago. Yeah, me too. I, I love growing up in the 70s and 80s. Um, this time of year, I lived in a town that had a, a river that would that went through the edge, edge of it. Now it's kind of built out like it's much bigger. But uh, my friends and I, we would meet up in the morning. We'd play baseball at the Diamond. And then a uh, fire whistle would blow at noon. We'd all go home. And after that, we'd meet and we'd go fishing down, <laughs> down at the river. And I'm, none of us had licenses. And so I had my little tackle box, right? And the fishing, it's just 12, 13-year-old kids, right? And it's great. No cell phones, nobody hassling you. So uh, let's see. 
This is agorizer. The real world seems to be over. It's clown world now. Yeah, it's I've I've shared with people that the way I need to, I think this really it transfers over to like the classes I teach. So I've taught hundreds of classes in the last 20 years, right? From everything from statistics, different level of statistics to school administration. And I and I definitely see that what I have to teach is, it's kind of like, here's what the law says, or here's what best practice says. And here's also like, what could actually happen to you? <laughs> or like if a, if a judge or DA didn't back you or your board of education, where I didn't have to say that in the past. Like, say so there's like two, there's a reality and then there's like a quasi reality that we're in right now. Um, so, you know, you got to keep your, it, like, this is the time in life when I, I'm honest with people and said, you know, like doing the right thing 20 years ago, largely would, you'd be vindicated. You trespass to find the wandering student, right? Something like that. You'd be vindicated. I don't know if that's the case today, right? Um, I just, I do not, I, I'm, I'm less and less convinced that is the, the case. So how do you teach people to function and where they have to be able to make, apply discretion, they have to be able to allocate resources. They're in those positions to, to big things in, in very little amount of time. Um, how do you do that knowing that they're probably going to forensically be scrutinized and people will come out of the woodwork, especially on social media and, and try to skewer them? How do you do that? So that's where, I address that, right? You know, we come into that and that's really getting people tight with their board of education and tight with who they are in their organizations, but also knowing like a lot of people will spin away from you when the heat is up and everything looks great forensically. And I don't know, it's too bad we become that way as a society. Like, I think if the 9-11 rescue of 500,000 people in nine hours, only from Admiral Lloyd saying, hey, if you have a boat, come down here to Lower Manhattan, Battery Park and get rescue people. Today, we would probably have endless articles and studies of, oh, like how that was careless or how that psychologically damaged people or, you know, just, I mean, all these things would be criticizing the fact that that was the biggest, you know, civilian boat rescue in the history of mankind in nine hours the system develops and then it fades away. And it's like, how in the world did that happen? Which I wrote about extensively in School of Errors. But um, people always, I, I think, are trying to trip up other people or, or I, so, so that's where you have to know who you are and who your team is. And, um, I'll tell you one of the, one of the biggest things that new school administrators tell me. So this is, this is very important. So let's say you're 33 years old, right? And you're taking your first job or second job as a school principal. And, you know, there's, there's something coming up that's you know very controversial in your district, and you have to make some position on it, take some statement. Uh, you, anyway, you have to you have to do something where you know you're going to get criticized. Let's say it's masking or whatever. That everybody went through that. Um, these administrators tell me, you know what? Especially as they get a little bit later in their career and they have a family, you know, they've got an eight year old and a ten year old and you know a twelve year old, and they're like, Dave, you know, like I don't want to move again. I've moved four times because superintendents tend to last about two years in a position. I mean, a lot of these people are very good people, but these systems they enter are very dysfunctional. School boards get voted out and new people get voted in that didn't hire that superintendent. Just craziness, right? So if you're a superintendent, likely you're going to have many superintendent positions. And they're like, I don't want to move again. I don't want to uproot my family. You know, I don't want to try to sell a house again. I don't want to try to find a house. Like, so like I have to... That, that has to go into my decision-making. So it's really sad that we put people in those positions. But I saying, I believe there are good lawyers out there. I got helpful. There certainly are. There certainly are. And I, I said one, Lisa Linney, um, who was on my show. You can find the podcast I did with her. Lisa's in Houston, and, and uh, she's just a phenomenal person in addition to being an attorney. I worked with a lot of good attorneys. I also worked with a lot of really flaky attorneys. Um in the schools. Like I worked with an attorney who would say, Oh, Dave, let me research that. 
them to come back and say, like, well, there was a case like, you know, in, in Georgia, like nine years ago, where this one thing happened. And this is a, I'm like, well, but like, what are really the odds of that? And here's like three choices you have. And there's like different level of risk. I'm like, what do you think I should do? And people who, you know, just wouldn't commit to anything or, but, um, but you're right. I also work with people who are spot on. And like Lisa is one of those spot on people. Like I also step ahead of me as I start to talk about this. She's like, well, this crosses over to Good Samaritan. And she just does this because she's a good person. She's not charging me. I don't I don't get paid extra from the university to have Lisa help me with a, a document on compensatory education or something like that. So, so you're right. I mean, I think in all professions, right, there's, there's good people and bad people out there. I think schools, um, school attorneys, though, it's really a roll of the dice. Um, and I think there's there's really good test on there of how school, like, you know, you have a records request for a school and it comes back over here. It'll cost you $17,000 to see how many students were, you know, referred to the office in the first quarter. It's like, well, isn't that just a data thing that you're pulling up? Like, that's, it seems like that's a barrier to prevent me from finding out. So, Oh my God, CNT! Now all these people need puppies and cry. Clad. Um, check out the the um, the podcast I did with Ann Sturzinger. So, um, Sturzinger, maybe two years ago. CNT, check that out here. I don't know on the safety, but it's it's archived, right? Go to safetyph.com. Uh, we did a long talk about that. Um, so. Oh God, I don't have the, the story available, but somewhere uh, yesterday there was a, it was like mainstream news. It was one district was like, you know, teacher burnout, right? Start of the year. What are we doing to help teachers? And I've already addressed this many times. Like you address teacher burnout by hiring more teachers. There's a hundred thousand dollars or a hundred thousand teachers shortage, hundred thousand people short. So like, um, that's where you have your core business, like flying rich. And I talked about this, but, um, but they hired some person to come in and beat a drum to a song by Prince like Raspberry Beret. Honest to God. Um, let me see if I can find this. Um, school staff beats drum. Drum. Jeez. Two. That's great. By the way, um, I don't know. This Prince song plus mental. So I had something bad happen today, but it turned out okay. So I was out, you know, I, um, so I, I buy mulch dye that then I dilute in a sprayer and then I spray my mulch. I have red mulch in the front um, around a, a tree and a fire bush and then in the back around a tree and, and a couple other small trees. And it looks really cool. I have to do it like three times a year. It's much cheaper than buying new mulch. Um, so I had one of, I had a, <laughs> I had a quart, it's a plastic container, and I dropped it on my driveway, my concrete driveway. It slipped out of my hands. I don't know what the hell. And uh, I've been working, a little sweaty. And this thing like split on the side and it was like all, it looked like I killed somebody like right there. Like all is red dye. And I'm like, holy Christ, am I going to be able to get this off? So, I immediately like picked up the container and like three fourths of it was still full. And I like moved it over to the grass and then I'm like looking at this for a second. I'm like, okay, it's so, like quick grab some shop towels, soak up as much as I can. Then I ran for, um, I had a big container of, uh, um, dish soap that I use always to, every week to clean out my big garbage can I have to roll to the end of the driveway and whatever. Um, and then I had, uh, some, um, muriatic acid cause I was etching my concrete as I was doing some finishing last month. I mixed up those man, poured it over, used a, a, um, nylon bristle brush. And I just went to town like crazy, took out the hose, everything washed away. My God, there's not even, there's not the lightest sign that that stuff was there. So like that worked out, man, holy smokes. That was just absolutely crazy. So that could have really gone to hell. So anyway, like I can't find this story. I don't know, which is surprising because, but anyway, I don't know. So here's, so school had what was called like a mental health in service. They brought in some outside provider and, and they talked about this month outside providers. Like, Oh, you know, I had everybody like, you know, pounding on a drum to like in harmony to, um, 
Prince's Raspberry Beret. And I'm like, what in the world? Like that, that's not a long-term solution to mental health, right? People aren't going to be able to do that. And the core issue here is, is really, you know, it's, it's staff. These people aren't going to be doing this stuff at home. So that's what we have so many of these instances around close to where I am, where now they have in teacher contracts and student, uh, you know, uh, uh, days like, Hey, students can take five days off for mental health. What does it really mean? Like, you know, if you're just taking a day away, it's not technically improving things. Or if you're a teacher and you're like, well, it's a mental health day. I'm taking a day away. Now you, a lot of these people, when you talk to them, like I've talked to them, they said, well, now I've, I've just missed a day that I have to make up because maybe the sub isn't carrying out. This doesn't, in, this doesn't, address the root cause, right? Which is really the core business. We don't have teachers. So anyway, that, that article really fired me up because likely that district was paying that person several thousand dollars to come in with a couple drums and to play Prince's song. I think it's so short-sighted, right? But there's a lot of stuff in mental health services for schools and school safety that's short-sighted. So we talked about the law of necessity, which I think you need to have a basic understanding of. And as a school administrator, right? You need to be talking about your board on this, or like even try to give us some policy. And I will have students do that. We will put together what this would look like for discretion, a discretion policy for school staff, including the law of necessity, and get your school to, to commit to it. It's pretty awesome. Like when I do this stuff, like students really, really love these classes. Uh, so what else do I have here? So we talked about you know lost person behavior, how to get found, the school search. Do schools train for law students? Like most don't, but I would say most don't need to. So that's not a flaw in schools, but I do think it's a great exercise, a multi-agency exercise to do, because again, you can check radios, where to stage assets, all those things, without having to bring in the active shooter stuff. Um, but if you know as a school that you have a student that wanders, has wandered from home or has wandered before from your school, then absolutely yes. If a student has a history of wandering and you haven't put in protocol or even, you know, have a meeting to talk about a tracking device and how you, you know, um, and how you would search for, for a student, right? And how you might interface, like, how do you search, right? Like, how, how does that even look? Like, no one, then, yeah, you need to do that. Um, give the decision makers an alias. This is Heath for when they do the right thing that causes problems. So, yeah, it kind of reminds me of Batman. You know, the more I teach this stuff, honestly, <laughs> the more I do these these podcasts, I feel more like the Batman, you know, like the 2008 Christian Bale type Batman. I feel like I'm the Batman of the safety school safety world and just kind of maybe the safety world in general. Um, and maybe it's because when I wake up tomorrow morning, I'm not going to have somebody you know, on the phone with me saying, oh, like, you know, you can't say that. <laughs> I mean, I have had people actually from the state who who have said, you know, your position on whatever isn't quite aligned to it. I'm like, well, I don't care. I know what I'm doing is right. Like, you know, and, and if you've got a problem with it, then take it up with your own, you know, then you should be doing whatever. Like, I'm doing the heavy lifting here that you should be doing. I had that a couple of years ago. I, I don't know, somebody in my class, I think, was questioning something I was saying they, they were trying to get like a clarification from the state on it and like the Department of Public Construction. And they contacted somebody down there. And once they shared like kind of what I was saying, I don't know what exactly it was. I don't know the context on it. But then that person had contacted me and said, well, you know, we don't we don't quite take this position. And I'm like, well, why not? Well, you know, whatever. And then they like bumped it up and they had somebody else kind of I'm like, well, I'm not. And then they contacted the university. Well, we don't think I'm like, I don't care what I'm doing is right. I can back it up. Right. You know, velocity of information is 471 endnotes. I know what I'm doing. Like, so, um, too bad. And, you know, basically my conclusion there was I was pressing them to make a decision and act in something they didn't do and having to do something where inertia was serving them maybe better, right? And that's one thing like this. You see it a lot of times states will say, well, we don't want to do like an example of how to do with this drill or whatever, or this form, because then everybody will copy it and it won't be like unique to the setting. I'm like, well, that's garbage, right? Like if you've got a good template, like uh, REMS, that ed emergency readiness and man management has tools like people can upload um, forms that they have or tabletop exercise whatever and you you can you customize out to your site like that's just saying people are idiots they don't know how to customize things to their site it's a it's a real cop out 
for people to to not do their jobs. And well, if I give you a, a model of how to fill out these forms, right? Like then everybody will fill them out this way. And I'm like, yeah, but what's wrong with that? Like, I, don't, <laughs> I don't see the problem, right? <laughs> so, yeah, I, I actually, I appreciate getting in those discussions the older and older I get. Because you're not going to move me from my position, especially if I believe I'm, I'm in the right and I can back it. Get chalks and make some outlines, sidewalk chalk. What's that for? I, I did that in college. My roommates and I would go out at night with chalk and do all these like body outlines around campus. Next day, they holy smokes, I have it around here. It's a true story, by the way. CNT, when school systems went to 100% no tolerance, it took away the responsibility of thinking away from people that run schools. Some Someone jumps um, and and uh, on you in school, you defend yourself, you get punished too. So one of the things CNT is in 2014, the Obama administration did a dear colleague letter. And I actually wrote a paper kind of based upon this that should be in a journal, a major journal in November, December. I haven't got the final date on that yet. But, you know, I said when that letter came out to schools through the Obama administration, I, I can find it right here. It basically told schools don't suspend and also to um, cut back your discipline. If you don't, Office of Civil Rights will investigate your schools like they did in Oklahoma City and Oakland and Minneapolis and many others. And uh, not only find them, but then force them into these programs of remediation and things like that. So a lot of people don't know this. Yeah, <laughs> it's easy. I type in, it comes right up. So um, here's an interesting one. Let me bring this up. You can actually find this. This is by Max Eden, who was a guest on my show. This is 2019. Obama school discipline guidelines put students in grave danger. It's a dear colleague letter. So we have the I have the dear colleague letter I go through in my class. Um, so in 2014, what happened is the Obama administration sent this letter out to schools across the country and it said, hey, like you're suspending too many students and you have to stop it. And it didn't say what really to do instead. I mean, you can say things like restorative discipline, but I mean, largely like it just said you can't suspend. So one of the things that, um, and if you do suspend office, civil rights will get involved. You could lose funding. You have to do corrective action plans, all these things. So it was, it was bad stuff. Um, so that happened and school stopped suspending students big time. Like if you look like the, the number of suspensions, because suspensions are reportable to state and to federal to office of civil rights. So what they started to do instead was something called an abeyance agreement, da, 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 abeyance agreement, which my article is on, which is 8,000 words. It's a major, major research journal. You know, I'll be able to share when it comes out. I submitted that back July 5th. Um, school started to do abeyance agreements because abeyance agreements never make it to the books. They never are recorded. They're not reported to the Board of Education, to the state or the feds. So basically an advance agreement is saying this, oh, you got in a fight with a student, another student, or you, know, you, you vandalized school property. We're not going to have any consequence for you other than um, here's a consequence we would have had for you. But if you don't do anything to violate student code of conduct for the next 90 days, we'll just forget this happened. So basically it's a follow the rules. You did this, we'll forget about it. Follow the rules for nine days. We'll forget it ever happened. There'll be no record of it. So it really puts schools in a bad position. And it also creates a situation where you could have a student who could have multiple instances of um, violating student conduct very seriously, and there would never be a record of it because of the abeyance agreements, which is not part of school law. Schools just adopt it. And this is where school attorneys or lawyers for schools come in and they back these things. And you can like find a ton of them if you search online. There's no legal background for this whatsoever. That's where I've been in contact with the um, Northwestern Pritzker Law School and their team. They're doing a legal note, which a legal note is something outside of the law. And it basically comes in and it says like, here's an issue that the law didn't address, but should be addressed. Like abeyance agreements. Like here's what schools do for abeyance agreements. Here's, here's where other parts of law come into play. And like, here's why we shouldn't do abeyance agreements. It waives due process and also it, it erases the student record. <laughs> So like I wrote about this and I'm like, this is really a bad deal because like for school safety, 
um, you can have someone who's who has a lot of um, instances early on of harm to self or others that that's, that's being covered through an abeyance agreement never shows up. Like they go to another school and the school opens a file and say, oh, like we don't see anything here. So you, you don't have a pattern of behavior where you could proactively get that student some services because that behavior has never been documented. A band's agreement basically is magic. It goes away. It's really bad stuff, folks. It's really bad. Now, people will like fight me tooth and nail. They will just, they just hate this when I talk to school attorneys, hate this. And even like our state backs of band's agreements to the hilt, like they had a whole website to it and all of that, like a, or a web, you know, web page, a branch off of you know, band's agreements. And I'm like, this, this isn't part of law. Like, how can you, how can you say these things are working other than they're reducing suspension numbers? Like it's so wrong, right? That's why you have the safety doc here. So this is a CNT to Bacon. The safety doc saving that to watch later. I would say, well, CT, like the show I did with Ann Sturzinger, Larry Lawton, America's Biggest Jewel Thief, he has like 1.5 million YouTube subs, sub to him. The one I did with Justin Dooley, Dave Hyde early on. Uh, who's been a, a man who's blind from birth? And I interviewed Dave. He's like six years old. Like you know, so what are like what's the deal? Like how do you how do you stay safe? He has an amazing story. It was a great interview. He um, he worked in a prison as like a counselor early in his career. And like when they would do fire drills, he had to go up a ladder with his guide dog. Yeah, like carry his dog up a ladder and then like get the dog out on a roof and go down. It was just crazy. And and so like there's a lot of great shows I've done, but there's also like a lot of great interviews. Robert Travis, the Alaskan crab boat, uh, cra uh, crab boater. Holy smokes! Like that was a great interview. Um, you know Lisa Lene, and so I mean there are a lot of really good interviews. The one I did with Bacon, um, Bacon and I did a show on the the all the new terminology that hit at the start of the pandemic. Bacon was keeping a list: safer at home, social distance, um, flatten the curve, and you know, all these things. And that was really important because as humans, we are not used to suddenly having 15 new vocabulary words in 30 days and then those becoming part of our lexicon. So like if someone said to you social distance, that not, that meant you have to look at where you're at and where they're at, this person's at and you have to gauge that you're like six feet away, right? So it also had this action associated with well, those. Bacon really did a great job of keeping this inventory. He was it, all these photos he took, which never made it into my book, unfortunately. But, um, you know, like where streets were closed on one side because of like social distancing, but crazy stuff. But um, but that was a great show with Bacon, like during while things were happening in vivo. And we forget about these things. Right. But as a speech language pathologist, right, as a person who's kind of an expert in semantics like this, that wasn't normal at all. So um, that was a great show, though. We have the show, uh, Bacon, where's that show where, like, we had Nick Shoelander and they tried to kick down his door and steal his guitar. It was crazy. I forget what episode that was. Nick hung on, man. That, was, that guy's a fighter. Uh, Bolo, when one knows you aren't able to defend themselves, they are getting lost. Uh, could be, who knows? I mean, you, you see a lot of these these videos, right, where where. You know, someone is uh, being beaten up or whatever, and other bystanders walk away because, you know, they're saying, well, if I get, get involved, then I'm going to get charged, right? We don't have that very clear at all. Like if you, um, you know, if, if you inject yourself into a situation, what applies to you? Um, so um, this is CNT, Safety Doc. That was the school to prison pipeline. Yeah, it was. Yeah, the 2014. I think there was school to prison pipeline, a lot of narrative with that. The thing, I mean, that really hit schools was it, it came out, right, and there was no plan B. It's like stop the suspensions or else, you know, you'll be found disproportionate. You will have funding taken away. Office of Civil Rights will investigate your school, which all happen. You can find these. And it's like, so what do you do? Like restorative justice? Well, there's a lot to do with that. And not everyone's going to subscribe to that. Um, you have to commit a lot of resources. Schools are already down 100,000 teachers. So what do you do? And then a lot of schools said, well, then we're going to call the police. So you start to see police calls come up more frequently in schools because schools said, well, we can't intervene. And then we saw like, you know, remove police from schools. Two years ago became a big movement. And now schools are hiring police back, especially after you've all, so all of these things, right? It, re it really messed people up. But CT, you're right on this. You're right on the pulse of this. 
CG, the shooter at MSD in Florida could have been stopped. Um, so yeah, one of the things too, like, and you know, like with MSD and just schools in general is schools that have been through um, shooter events on campus, right? And they, you, you'll look at their, or I will look at their school handbooks that are posted online and, and whatever their policy, but especially their handbooks. And they, they still, they don't change. They don't say like must lock doors. It's always should lock doors, which really just, just floors me, right? Like if, if your school has had um, an active shooter situation, especially where students have been killed, and then you re-up the handbook and and uh, and get it out the year later, and it says schools should be there's door should be locked and that must be locked. Like how how does that exist? How do you square those two things? Like I to this day I still don't get that. I still don't get how the Safer Communities Bill came out without addressing locking doors. Again, it's a step. It's a logical step. Um, this is bacon. Here's that show. So, da, 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 da. I'm looking at what show is it? Oh, America's Bay. <laughs> Holy smokes. It's a, it's a show. It's a younger doc on that one. My Duluth Huskies hat. From when I threw out the first pitch at the uh, Huskies game. And uh, what is it here? I have the ball. Severely faded, by the way. July 31st, 2019. I threw out the opening pitch at a minor league baseball game um, where the, uh, the team honored me for uh, releasing school of errors and my contributions to school safety is right after my PBS presentation was like three weeks before a national PBS presentation, my second one. And uh, my family, we were all, you know, we were, were hosted by the, the minor leagues. They, they, they were absolutely great. And uh, my youngest daughter and I, you know, uh, went out on the field. I threw out the opening pitch. Um, it's really, it's on video. It's out there. Does anybody have that? Let me, let me find it for gosh sakes here. Um, uh, yeah, I, I am, I'm hiccuping, which probably means I'm dehydrated from all the work I did outside today, but, um, uh, shouldn't be real hard to find. It's been out there a while. Yeah. All right. Let me show you this. And, uh, I don't have, I don't, I don't know how to get the audio on this. So I'll just narrate it. It's really short. So this was, so on July 31st, 2019, um, the Duluth Huskies, Duluth, Minnesota, minor league baseball team had um, invited me to be there, the person throw out the opening ball, like to celebrate my work. I had gone to school in Superior, which is right across the, the bridge, Lake Superior. So it's like three miles away from where this the stadium is in Duluth. So I had some ties to the area, right? But um, but yeah, they invited me up. And and so this was like dock at the ballpark day. Like people were meeting me as I had my picture taken with people. There's like a banner like in the lobby. And so it's down. It was really cool. It was, it was really awesome, man. So so this guy, you know, and all these interns are like 20 years old. So this guy's like announcing me. And uh, as artificial turf field. This feels like really amazing, by the way. Like they built it out of bricks the stadium that were brought from downtown from like the 1880s. They cleaned all these bricks off, built the stadium in like 1940, CCC project. So this stadium is like really, it's like something you, this is like before, start of the game here. So this is something you'd see like in, in um, a league of their own. Like it's really cool. Like the stadium, it's not like I would say polluted with like all these like jumbotrons and stuff. There's, I just tore my uh, hamstring by the way. Like, so I'm going out there, I'm like all lathered and Ben gay. Like that was a rough, my daughter's like doing the, the stuff there, my youngest. So, um, so yeah, so I'm throwing out this opening pitch and they're like doing stuff for the intercom and, and stuff like, I got like the Luth Husky shirt they gave me. They gave me this like visor and, and you're like a hop, uh, just kind of lame throw, but you know, but it was, a, it was absolutely amazing, man. It was so cool to do that. Um, and they're like, now it's all faded, but it was just really cool. Yeah, it was a great time, it was, you know, and to come in and, and, you know, to have them recognize. But I'm like, you know, with all the stuff, like the school safety stuff and writing a book, and I'm like, there's a lot of cool things that I, like, I meet a lot of cool people, right? But, like, being invited to throw out a, the opening pitch at a minor league game and have them, like, kind of, like, you know, do everything, you know, it's a minor league 
not that you know, some free food and tickets and stuff like that but have you know people meet you and you're taking your picture of people and your people are taking a picture with you and it's just a good thing it was really a good thing so look at this dun 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 nice oh, yeah. that was that was one of the coolest things i've ever done and the fact my family was there but like my youngest daughter came out and um you know there's a big thing for her like to to be out there with dad as i as i threw that out this is really cool yeah, that was, that, was, that was an awesome night, man. That was just, that was a really cool, a really cool thing. You know, so that's where I look and I'm like, what is the book brought to me? I mean, it's brought a lot of really awesome people into my life, right? Um, but in addition to that, you know, it's brought me some really unique opportunities. And, you know, we were going to go to Disney you know, right like when the pandemic hit and it was like we had like a week after that, we were booked out in Disney had all this stuff like to celebrate the book and my work in school safety and one other people, you know, one other folks have been in contact with me and like, they're going to do special things and that never happened. Like, you know, but that would have been cool. I still have like the letter from Disney on that. Like, Hey, you know, who knows what that would have been like. Um, Bacon is saying to CNT, check out the video, like all hell broke loose. Every city. That was a wild night. Yeah. That was when there was a podcast where I had the, police scanner on like Madison, Wisconsin. There were like numerous like um, riots, protests, burglaries, places being set on fire. A police car was set on fire. Uh, and by the way, like a lot of that is never recovered. It's two years later. Like a lot of these places are never back. And more of them are actually leaving that area because of like, you know, burg multiple repeated burglaries and stuff like that. But that was a night where it was like, boy, we could be a day or two away from you know, like just the stop of semis going to cities because, you know, they would be, be looted or, I mean, we were really at the cusp of some really bad time, which could return. But when we were doing that show, you know, Bacon and with Nick, because, you know, different parts of the country we had represented, like that was, that was a moment in time when you had to think like, what will things be like in 24 or 48 hours? I mean, could you see a complete just suspension, like bank shut down? And um, yeah, I, I don't know. But so before the dark times, it's Bolo. It's never dark in Canada where Bolo's streaming the show on nine devices. Thank you, Bolo. Appreciate that. Spam about to the bacon. A whiskey suggestion for you. Glenn Farkless 105 at 60% ABV. Spambot. Stuff's like acetone. It's highly volatile. So you're wild, my friend. Um, at the start of this is CNT, the riots and TIFA BLM were live streaming everything. They were yeah, I mean, right, a lot of that. I I was I, you know, there's scanner app or I don't know, whatever it is. It's online. Like you could find different city. And the first day or two in different cities like Kenosha, like that wasn't really encoded, right? So you could, re I have recordings from everything like the the first night in, in Kenosha. I just had it recording. And you can hear the desperation in the fire department saying, hey, like there's people running over our hoses or like getting out and like, you know, cutting our hoses and we only have so many. And I mean, people in, in the water towers, you know, like the city reporting, you know, like the water towers down to like 10%. I mean, it was desperate. It was just a horrible time. No one's coming to help them. That was a part, um, which I anticipate we'll hear some of those. We have a governor election in my state, and I would be anticipate we're going to hear some of that playback from that night. This is a bacon to CNT. Bonus points happen to be recording when the alerts came through, but before the freeway got shut down, yeah, this is crazy. Crazy. So, you know, this this is a question, and I don't have it in this year's class for my my new soups, but I had it, I think, last year, or I definitely had it the year before. And I said, you know, so let's say that you have some students who are in a van, and they've just went to participate in a tennis match, right? And on their way home, um, the road they're going, the interstate or whatever, suddenly, you know, stops. And you get, you know, they get information, right? That there's a, a um, protesters have shut down the interstate. And not only that, protesters now are going car to car in their 
you know, like smashing windows and, and stuff. Um, what? And so this person in the van calls you and they're like, I'm in a van um, one block ahead of me, like four cars ahead of me. I can see, you know, cars are they're you know, the hoods are being jumped on and they're moving like toward us. I have six kids in the car from the tennis team. What do I do? So as a superintendent, what do you do? Like that person's called 911, no one's answering. Do you get out of the vehicle? Do you, does that person have discretion to try to, to take them, lead them to an area away from there? The vehicle's basically toast at that point. What do you do? So then I would tell this, some of the soups, I said, call your insurance company and then let's share in class what they told you. And what do you think happened, right? What do you think happened when these soups called their insurance company? Their insurance carrier said, well, you know, it's it's a case by case situation. We if you willingly give up the vehicle, like there's something, you know, like, but they wouldn't take any position on anything. And that's also where the state organizations should have come out because a lot of districts had these same questions, right? What do you, what do you do? Like when you're in care of your best interest for, for those, this was a very po real possibility in 2020. And this is where the organizations would back off. And that's where I would point out to my new superintendents and school leaders. I say, there's where your organizations abandon you. And if you're paying three to $5,000 for these organizations to give a conference on what they think should be out there to give you a newsletter updates on things that they think are important and they're not willing to answer these questions, you shouldn't be paying the three to $5,000 to them. So like I've seen nobody ever take a position on that, but you have to take a position, right? Imagine you're the soup and you're getting this call and saying, you know, what, it looks like we've got 10 minutes and this is going to get to us. What do we do? Um, and we call 911, we're not getting anything. Like, what do you do? So that's where you need to be able to have discretion. You need to also be able to share that discretion down to that person who's in that van. So Andrew's saying deadly force should be allowed if someone's cutting a fire hose. So that that was very frequent in the Kenosha um, scanner stuff. So if I go through, like there's many instances of, of fire hoses being cut. And like, the thing with Kenosha too is you weren't getting mutual aid. So meaning other communities aren't sending their fire apparatus to you. Like a fire truck is a million dollar investment. They're not sending it over to you to have it set on fire, right? I mean, really, you know, you know, now, you know, ladder truck takes two years to build and stuff. People are like, we're not doing that. So you're on your own. Um, and of course the, uh, the, our, um, Wisconsin National Guard was told to to stand down. You know, it, it was just absolutely horrible. Um, it was it was horrible. Listening to the recording, which again becomes indisputable forensic evidence, right from scanner app. Uh, it's you can tell the situation falls apart, and all these 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 levels where it falls apart, and all the opportunities for a the the governor, I would say, to to intervene in this, right, and that never happened. So, I mean, I, I, I don't know. I mean, if I were to, to, to play it back, right, and to go through it, be like, there's a point, there's a point. You know, the water supply is, is you know, really low in the time. And, and at night, like your water supply is the highest in your water towers because it pumps at night, goes down. So like the next day, you probably wouldn't have water. And, you know, what do you do if your fire departments no longer can respond because they're not safe? Like, how do you go in for public safety? And now you have apartment buildings on fire. Maybe you have a um, assisted living center that's set on fire. Because I think like the dinosaur museum was, but what if you have that? The assisted living center is set on fire. Um, so, you know, all of these things, right? Um, pretty crazy. You, def you defend yourself, that's CNT. So these are questions that, I mean, I'm not disagreeing with you, Coop. Um, these are questions though, like that you, you need to, have these discussions ahead of time with people and get them on record. <laughs> That's what I tell my students, man. You got to get your school board on record. I had a school administrator tell me, you know, like I've had an issue with a side door where parents like um, come in and then it's like we only have one staff down there and it gets overwhelmed. And I told my soup, you know, I I need more people for this door at the end of the day or whatever. And, the, and there was no response. And, and I'm like, you email all of that out. You take a picture of, I mean, all of this stuff because right. The, the time when, when this goes, you recognize this is an issue, you know, you've moved staff as much as you can, but that there needs to be a communication out from district office or that door needs to permanently be 
be locked in a different entrance, right? But then the parents are going to come after you and be angry at the board. So that's these things of like, you know, how to, to get people to think different and to get them, get them to put other people who are in a position to have their back to make a commitment. Claim declined, Bolo, right? Hey, look, our, our loaner fire engine's on the news. Wait, it's on. Exactly. I mean, that's the thing, Bacon. Um, the whole mutual aid aspect two years ago fell apart. Um, well, I mean, fire, police departments would would intervene to some extent, but they're not. No one, nobody was sending a fire truck to Kenosha. Absolutely not. Um, because then, yeah, I mean, you can't take that risk with your community then to have that asset not come back to you if it can't be adequately protected. You also see that in northern Wisconsin a lot. Like the, the community is up there. It's kind of like very, you fight it on your own, man. You're not calling all this mutual aid because like you might call from a department that only has like one fire truck or two. And so, but, but yeah, th this was a thing. And that's where, you know, National Guard has, could either protect a scene, could escort fire apparatus, does have fire apparatus, right? Um, so that's where like our governor says, oh, I wouldn't do anything different. I'm like, are you insane? You look back at that and you say you, in your campaign thing, oh, I wouldn't do anything different. Are you nuts? You gotta be kidding me, man. Like, of course that was not handled appropriately at all. And at least look at it with hindsight and say, knowing what we know now and you know, whatever. I mean, there's a tactful way, but to just say, oh, I wouldn't do anything different. Basically, that's garbage. You gotta be kidding me. Wow. Um, CNT, if you act and shut down orgs. Uh, so, yeah. You know, it's, so CNT, I, in Philosophy of Information, and Joe Dolio um, contributed um, significant sections to Philosophy of Information. Um, some of these organizations were, were very thorough in, I guess, uh, keeping the integrity of the organization and then got infiltrated from outsiders, right? People, like there were a lot of people, for example, in Kenosha who didn't live in Kenosha, who who were bussed in from four hours away with an agenda, carry this sign and do this thing and here's whatever money. Like, you know, you saw things on Craigslist. Um, so, you know, when they would arrest people and they would say, here's where they're from, it's like, well, what in the world? So some of these organizations, um, you know, got, were, were quasi infiltrated by people that they would not typically have in their organizations. I don't want to go too deep into that, but I, when you read the velocity of information, Joe Dolio brings, brings light upon that. Um, Spamba, I know Cube, uh, Quebec still sends fire trucks into borders. To, right. Okay. I mean, if it's just, a, it's a, if it's a fire, right. Or a wildfire, I mean, that's, different. Like if it's a riot situation, like people are not, the communities are not going to send their resources over um, because it'll be like, it can't be protected. Uh, CNT. And I can very well tell you, Kenosha was on their own that night. Um, again, that's anybody with the, the, um, the scanner and <laughs> recordings can, can lay that out. CNT and, to Andrew, I think and remember that wasn't he's some handyman, so possibly he was. Um, not for eyes, right? It's for forest fires, for angry trees, for advertising. Whoa, right here, spend by. Yeah, I mean, mutual aid is a terrific component of um, the the rescue system, and actually, that's gone so far in the last 10, 20 years. Mutual aid, mutual response is is really great it's for you know fires, floods, disasters, things like that. Mutual aid services, um, and it used to be like fire departments and emergency response. They typically didn't do that. I wrote about that in in School of Airs. Like mutual aid wasn't that common for forest firefighting in California in the sixties. Right. And it, it, you know, kind of started to come on board in the seventies and then the eighties, it really took off. Um, so mutual aid is a good thing. Now in a time of again, riot or pro protests, um, people, um, governments are going to be local governments are going to be very measured on sending mutual aid outside of law enforcement into areas. Um, so 
Um, let's see. Angry trees. You gotta be kidding me. Angry trees. Um, so plus yoga prints. Still trying to find this article. I should have retweeted it or somehow got it out where I could remember it. Um, so I'm, I'm surprised I can't find this. Oh, maybe I found it. I think I did find it. We'll see. Did I find it? Oh, give me a second here. I don't know if it's... No, I think this is it. Yes, it is. This is the article. Let me bring it up. All right. K, uh, K-I-N-G would like to send you push notifications. Thanks. By the way, um, this, this is for uh, Bacon. There's a 2022 she- uh, Chevy Silverado 1500 for 53244 at Don Larson Chevrolet. So if you want, I'll call tomorrow, Bacon, and tell him to hold it for you. Right here. 2022 Chevy Silverado for the uh, brisk price of 53244 Holy smokes, man. It's crazy stuff. So this is the article I was talking about. Um, this is published two days ago. It was K5, NBC, whatever here. But back to school brings a focus on mental health, which isn't by itself a negative thing. Um, but this is Concord. New- Jeez, get off of here. This is the one, Concord, New Hampshire, with Prince's Raspberry Beret blaring in the background. Remember that song? Raspberry Beret. She wore a raspberry beret. I don't know. About 20 New Hampshire ed- educators grab wooden sticks. Isn't a stick typically made out of wood? But um, And began pounding their tables to the beat. There's not really a beat to that song, is there? But, I mean, like, we're not going to take it by Twisted Sister. I could see that, but. Raspberry. I don't know, man. I don't think I could do that. That's. I don't really know where there's a good beat with that song. Emily Daniels, who is leading a two-day workshop on burnout, um, on burnout, a two-day work, a two-day workshop, right? On burnout, encouraged the group, including teachers, school counselors, therapists, social workers, to stand up inside a hotel conference. What? Why are you having a hotel conference where you have schools facilities to do this, and you're renting? Schools would do this. I remember a district I worked with would just rent out like this hotel and their conference stuff for meetings instead of, and I'm like, you, they did have their own facilities to do this, but it's easier to have somebody else do it. Anyway, before long, the group was banging on walls and whatever else they could find. Laughter filled the air. A few started dancing. Oh my God. Oh Lord. This is where like Aaron Clary and I would be a good tag team right now. My good buddy, Cappy. Rhythm making off rhythm making offers the body a different kind of predictability that you can do every single day. Says said Daniels, a former school counselor, created the regulated classroom, which trains teachers. I bet she makes a ton of money off this, on how to manage their own nervous system and in turn reduce stress. This won't this won't work at all. <laughs> this 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 during the workshop at the hotel be fine, and when you actually get into these school setting, this isn't this isn't going to work, right? Um, but anyway, it's a face validity. Oh Lord, the training session is part of a growing. This is growing. This is people are getting paid to do this. They're doing sessions, and so is this actually instructor? Emory? Oh my God, what's this lady doing? She's like, did I put on deodorant this morning? What's going on over here? I don't know, man. This lady is all into it. She's like, I am going to pull down this ceiling fixture and show Bolo. I'm like, I don't know, man. So I don't, you can usually look at, I don't know, whatever's on the table here. I don't get this whole bunch of snacks. Look at someone has a captain hat or a big ashtray right here. I don't know what this is. Bottled water, of course. I don't know. Man, I just don't, I just... The thing is, like, there's no research part of this. Like, you're not measuring how people 
are applying this once you get out of this training, right? There's no measurement. And there might be a survey, but a survey is really weak research. And, you know, it's, and you can't account for other variables, right? You know, like even if like staff, it was like a sunny week and kids were able to get out at recess versus a rainy week and kids were inside, like that significantly changes how staff would perceive student behavior in their own stress levels. But I'm going to keep going through this one because this just amazes me. Again, because people are, are making big money off of this. Like if I was totally to rebrand myself into like this, the, the safety sensei or something like that, I'll have to check if that website's available, although people wouldn't know how to spell sensei. I don't even know how to spell it, but um, you'd make a, you'd make bank on this. Bolo, think about it in Canada because I'm not going to go over borders to try to do this. Um, addressing the mental health challenges of students coming out of the pandemic as a, yeah, yeah, I get it, get it. Many p districts face hiring challenges. This is what Rich and I talk. Rich said, your core business, work on hiring people, right? Hire teachers. So um, so educators help to retain. Doing this is not going to retain people in your building. Sorry, not going to happen. Um, school districts that provide increased mental health. Is this really mental health, though? What is this like a mental health program or is this like a technique you're teaching? Like I can teach someone. Joe Dolio could teach someone one martial arts move, you know, boot to the head. Nah, nah, remember that, Dr. Mento? Like, he could teach you boot to the head. Now, does that make you trained in martial arts, right? That you can see this is this is where it's like this now is a this is a technique. This is some and I just I don't I don't agree with this stuff. I just don't. I think it's it's I go back to the four vagabonds with Henry Ford and Edison, you know, and and stuff like that of being able to to you know talk things out. Um, as a, as a group, you know, this, this type of thing also like here, you're doing it as a group, but in reality, this is very isolating. You're doing this on your own or in your home, or you're, you're trying to tap out whatever on your, your steering wheel to a song. Um, I'm not a big fan. I'm not a fan of this. I don't really see where the research support, like there should be a research component, even this article, I guess we'll see, but uh, Karen Bowden Gurley, a fifth grade teacher, said she attended the training on burnout, but she also feels student burnout. The demands on all of us were really high. We're trying to make up for lost time in a couple of years. So true. And part of this then is your administration and your your state, not like Minnesota saying you missed a semester really of in-person teaching. Now we expect you to make all of that up, right? Yeah, this, this, is, uh, this is a curriculum issue, right? Like you can't teach what you're teaching now, in addition, teach what you missed. You have to make some decision on that because you only have so much time. So this is really a good point, but the point is, it's a curriculum issue. And no matter what you do with beating your sticks here, Raspberry Beret, c and Designs, Coop making me a sign for my office. It'll have LED lights, Maybe it'll be better operated or it'll have a cord. It's going to look cool because he's a cool dude. Agorizer in Bolo, Canada, you can wear a beret. I feel better. All right. Um, in a survey, here's a survey. Surveys suck. Yeah, I wrote about that in School of Errors, man. Survey says, surveyed by the RAND Corporation, twice as many principals of teacher report frequent traffic. Free, free, how frequent? And what are you, if you survey somebody after a week of severe, after a week of rain, after a week of severe weather, after a school shooting that's been publicized on the news, what will people report, right? It's recency effect, positive recency. Nobody talks about that in these surveys. You have no context. A study from a coal, Jesus, you got a survey here in a coalition. Then you got a coalition of mental health organizations of New Orleans, and you don't think there would be implications of, of weather that would impact the greater New Orleans climate for a lot of things, right, of, of safety and stability, right? Found educators during the pandemic reported rates of emo what is emotional distress, like what is this? Um, similar healthcare workers, 36% screen positive for anxiety. Like what, so what does that actually look like, right? 35 for depression, right? So what would these people have screened for before any of this happened? What's your baseline? How do they screen now? And what is what is your construct? This is so anxiety is a construct. So how are you trying to figure out if people are anxious? 
And you really can't do a screening for this. It's not like Cologuard for cancer, right? For colon, colon cancer. I mean, you're having to ask people, do they really understand the questions you're asking? Depression. Um, to, you know, so again, these are all constructs. You have to, in research, you have to figure out how you're going to study these things, where you're going to get your baseline, the questions you're going to ask, and what informs post-traumatic stress. So are you going to look a year out, two years out? You're going to interview people if they encountered something from four years ago. What if someone has post-traumatic stress syndrome, but they were in New York as a teacher at the time of 9-11 back in 2001, but like you don't know that. So now when things happen, they, so I mean, all of these things, like, anyway, it's all pretty bad, said, said Lay, Leia, Lee, McLean, the primary investigator at the teacher emotions character. There's a lab at the University of Delaware, oh my God, who has found levels of depression, anxiety, exhaustion among elementary teachers are 100% to 400% before the pandemic interesting right i mean i don't know how was it for 9 11 or i man i don't know um and how are you measuring this like do you have what is what is your, I, again i haven't looked into this i didn't even know this existed but um and again part of part of this goes back to you you can look at this stuff but you have to then link it as flying rich said he's right on to the core business what were teacher level staff? What was your your teacher um, level before in, in 2018 and 2017 and 2016 versus 2020, 21, 22? Because we know like the teacher shortages now are about 100,000 teachers and 2025 be 200,000 teachers. That all plays into this, right? If you have a teacher who has 40 kids in the classroom versus 20. But so anyway, she saw those issues increasing the most early on. Some districts have or are planning to invest federal COVID dollars in mental health. I've talked about that. I think they're just they have no idea what they're doing. Um, boost retention. This doesn't work to boost retention. A fifty thousand dollar bonus in Des Moines public schools that's out there right now isn't um, increasing retention. So this isn't going to re. re I don't know. But. Um, ultimately benefit the, you know, how can you say this, this ultimately, ben, you know, it's, it's all these things among the state singling out teacher mental health, but what do you do, right? The biggest thing you can probably do for teachers is to have fully staffed schools, right? Like, and again, I talked about that on John Combrive live, you know, billion dollars coming out for mental health, but for schools, but yet schools will be down a hundred thousand teachers across the country. Next, next to me, like, you know, our state capital, that county, which is a very wealthy county, they're down 400 teachers to start the school year. So the Atlanta School District launched a service with Emory University using federal funds to provide mental health services, dubbed Urgent Behavioral Response Grant. Unreal. It funds 11 clinicians from Emory who provide emotional behavioral assistance during school hours struggling school employees. Okay. But again, hire people, Right. That's the core business. We know we're down 100,000 teachers. Hire people. And if it's difficult to hire people, figure out and invest in your task force and whatever and hire people. Um, this isn't going to make people hang around longer. They're going to go somewhere else. The Delaware District, meanwhile, hired two social and emotional learning coaches, which could have maybe been teachers. So you could lower class sizes, right? And have more one-to-one -one student contact time and, and uh, school connectedness research by the CDC has proven that that's effective and increasing academic performance and social emotional. But anyway, you're hiring all these ancillary, these things in the constellation that are outside in the constellation, but not like your core business. I just, I don't go for it. And it's not like these people are, are like, there's abundance of these people to hire anyway. But anyway, if you can imagine a teacher as a classroom where students are engaged, they're helping each other, positive support of their job satisfaction is likely to be, likely to be higher. John Cooper, the director of Colonial School District, said, Health and Wellness Division said they are less likely to lead a profession. You don't know that. You have no idea, John. First of all, you're making a statement here. If you can imagine a teacher in a classroom where students are, but isn't this like obvious, right? They're helping each other, but that would be likely that you're appropriately staffing your school, right? That, that teacher maybe has a caseload of 18 or 18 kids and not 38 because you're down a position. So instead of hiring another teacher and putting all your resources there, you've hired a coach to come in and and beat the drum with this teacher 
30 minutes a week. I mean, I don't like it. I don't like this. Houston, which started building calming rooms where students can go to decompress. But again, what are you really doing and teaching in these, these settings? And what, what's your data for this? What's your baseline? And again, you know, I know a lot of schools that do this, but then when you exit out into this, there's a point when you have to teach like debate skills, right? And and debate now has become like this crazy thing of, of or at least have these rooms where you can also use it to teach debate skills where, where positions, other people's positions. Larry Lawton and I talked about this and it was on the interview I did with him, but we've also talked about it. Um, when I was in high school, we had a, not when I was in high school, before I was in high school, my brother, um, they had debate teams and Saturday nights, there was a debate. It was on TV, right? Your local TV channel and, and the schools would, would have their debate teams. And we don't do that anymore. We don't teach that in schools to anybody at any level. There's no debate. Um, so we're, so what's the skill you're teaching here? Because if the skill is to remove yourself from the situation, you're not always going to be able to do that. Right. And especially what if you're in a situation where you are in, you know, it's, it's a, it, it, uh, your, your area is flooded, right. And it's a crisis situation. You can't just say, well, you know, go to a situation area where you can decompress. No, you have to, you have to be able to engage in getting yourself rescued, right. With your parents or with other people, or if you're in a car accident, right. This is where like REMS TA, I think, you know, rims that ED, they do a really good job of coming into schools and teaching kids. Hey, like if a tornado comes through your town or whatever, you're in a vehicle accident, like we're going to put a car outside and we're going to put it like upside down. So like, here's how to crib it. Here's like to get people out. Like they do that. And I think like we've, we, so the part of this, like I would dig into say like, so, so tell me more about like, what's the, da the data or the skills? Because if you're plan is you will continually go to these calming rooms, which I know districts around us have this issue. And they'll say, we don't know how to do attendance when a student spends half their day in a calming room. Well, it's like, well, that's a problem, right? I mean, that's because it's also where when they get out of high school, it's going to transfer over to what they have to do into work or to maintain their family or even like, you know, their personal time and grocery shopping and care. I mean, all these things so it sounds like a lot of these things get really thin when you get to the research side of it. The rooms would be different for traditional teacher breaks. It doesn't work. Teachers already have the teacher lounge and teachers, when they get a break, they want to scramble and get their lessons and grading because they're in this crazy system where they have all the student testing they're responsible for and how their, their pay gets tied to how their students perform on tests. Like that's the, the system, which is, is really hampering teachers and not allowing them to teach, right? They're having to prepare kids for these state tests, which nobody looks at, but then we get issued state report cards and one school's compared to another. And then eventually like a teacher gets linked in, oh, like, you know, you're teaching this fourth grade and they didn't do well in math or whatever, but you know. Um, so all this crazy state testing. An elementary school in Indiana starts a week with mindful money. And you know, some of these things aren't bad, like to have some reflection and stuff like this where teachers guide their classes, deep breathing. There's also thoughtful, thoughtful Thursdays, fun Fridays, wacky Wednesdays, taco Tuesdays, all that stuff. Um, you know, there's a, there's a lot though to be, if when I, when I did the velocity of information, when I wrote the velocity, holy smokes. When I wrote the velocity of information, um, and I looked at the propaganda leading up to World War II in the U.S. and the Committee for National Morale. And that there's so much that could be learned from just looking at like Committee for National Morale and the visuals you put around teachers and the messaging and how you do that to get the community to help people keep morale up during trying times. Right? That's not anywhere in here. Um. So, in studies. One, one of these is cultivating awareness. I hope this article ends eventually. Cultivating awareness and resilience in education care and studies of its use among 224, which is a very small sample group of New York teachers, by the way. I mean, that could be teachers like literally like in one building. Researchers found statistically significant, statistical significance, yeah, I don't know, but put it down here. In, uh, improvements, including reductions in emotional, I don't know, man, again, one of the things I look at is, is the school, is the building fully staffed right away? Researchers also found that extended to students who show, what is increased engagement? I mean, and part of that is just how you set up the classroom. 
with open-ended questions, you know, like, um, you know, if, if, if we had to go to the moon next year, like what are things that we could get together right now? Like as think about, you know, Oh, kids like, you know, whatever, we got this new thing or we could like get drones and like, those are open-ended questions. So like problem, you know, I don't know. It's a lot of this is how you structure things. Your stress level can rise without you realizing. Yeah. I mean, part of it is like state the obvious. I don't like that. I don't like the state the obvious stuff. Jeez. This article is way, this article is way too long, man. Back in New Hampshire, the educators push aside the tables, of course, because they're at the hotel and we're mastering a series of stretching movements. You'll never, you'll never do this. Known as Q Zhang. Quiz Zhang, Bolo, can you can you demonstrate that? Put a put a video up on how to do this. What in the world? You'll never do this. Quiz Zhang, not very flexible, by the way. This probably wouldn't work for me. Then they gathered in a circle for an exercise that aims to synchronize their nervous. How can you how can you tell that without like actually having like a, a, a in vivo cat scan going on people right like aims at synchronous you got to be kidding me um known as collective rhythm making they began clapping their hands and, i can't snap my fingers in unison am i the only one who's kind of uh questioning this so and afterwards i'd be the teacher coming back going with hr and saying hey how's it how's the advertising we just paid this person whatever thousand dollars to come in like how's the advertising going for like a an additional second grade teacher it's a program here, so whatever. I mean, it's all, it's the articles what I'm going after. The article's written with obvious bias here. Jeez. Man, I don't know. This is, this is, this is crazy stuff. Two hours spent on that. There's a Labor Day sale here from Dell. What else we have? Watch. A shoe. Yikes. Watch isn't bad, but I don't like a leather band. Whoa! Bolo, there it is for you. It's you, it's you and Bacon. You're going to battle out 53 grand right there. If I place the call tomorrow morning, they'll hold it for you. So that's pretty sweet. Um, I wouldn't mind that. I don't have a garage that really would accommodate that very easily, if at all. But that's, that's, a, that's a sweet ride right there. I... I would, I would go for that. I'm not looking to buy a vehicle, but like if I were to buy a truck, like I would buy that. That looks really cool. So that looks really cool. So anyway, so it's just me. Is it, is it just me? Um, this is from Coop. Um, I've been slouching my chair here. Like I've gotten four inches shorter since the start of the show. I thought the safety doc was six foot tall. He was. By the end of the show, he's five nine. Uh, the safety doc. That is an article where someone is trying to. Ju- yeah, it is. And the and the other part of it is right that they're being justified. The money's out there. There's a billion dollars right now for school mental health. Like there there isn't a competition to come in and do this. Like people are hanging out their shingle and they're being brought in with like very little vetting of their programs and stuff like this. And um, and the thing is, like again the the schools are asking for this and we go back to the core business of schools and hr department should be all out focused in on hiring teachers and then also um things like rubric based learning in classrooms which kids love bringing technology into classrooms which kids love you know, imagine if if you, you know, a drone is pretty inexpensive and you're using a drone and you're taking weather measurements with it and you're teaching kids this and you're also doing distance and, I mean, all these things, like, right? And yet, you know, because it's, oh, it's cost prohibitive. It's not cost prohibitive. This presentation probably could have bought that for every building you have. Um, CT, that truck, will, it, it would. I'm not in the business for a truck, man. I don't have the garage. That's... That will always be wherever where I live. I will never be able to have anything like that and keep it inside. And in Wisconsin, 
you know, I can't have that outside. The winters would eat that thing alive. Um, but it would look good, man. I'm, it's still up on the other screen. It's like over here. It's like, hey, yeah. You know, that's, that's where if I would have, if I would have gotten, I know there was a branch in my life I was going to do a little more like search and rescue like stuff. Um, this would have been the vehicle for that. So be like the volunteer search and rescue guy, like learn the drone stuff and, or show up to like areas like in our area every couple of years, like tornadoes go through. And then the next day they're like, Hey, like if you want to help with the rescue, like show up at whatever this is a vehicle I'd drive up in. It would, man, Coop, you're right. I'll bring it up one more time for you. Dun, 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 it's right there. So, yeah, I have my car. So I, have a v, I have a Buick LaCrosse with a V6, 310 horsepower, and that thing sits low to the ground. Um, I took my daughter to a, uh, a festival downtown um, last weekend, and she opened up the door. Like, we were parked by the curb, and, like, the door hit the grass, right, like, next to the curb. It barely clears the curb. Like, that vehicle sits so low to the ground. So like for a long ride, it's awesome because it's got a ton of power. It's all cush. It's big. Now like to park it, like I never know where the hell a vehicle is in space as a backup camera, but like it's from 20, the vehicle's 2017. So like it doesn't have all the super high tech stuff and I don't have sensors on the front. So I kind of have an idea of where it's at when I park, but it's so big. That's, that's the last of the big vehicles that they really made. Uh, for the Buicks, I don't, they don't even make Vic, they don't make sedans anymore. Buick, but uh, but yeah, I don't. I'm like, but I told her, I'm like, you know, right? Like this, the vehicles, the door is going to hit any <laughs> anything. So it really opens slowly on that. So BV is saying, hey, get a get a uh, carport. I don't have room for that, man. I don't, I don't, I don't have room. I don't have room for it. So. Uh, and not not to be uppity, but in the na- I, the neighborhood I live in, there really aren't like carports. It, so like, you know, I I'd say like I'm at the the very end of where like the very wealthy neighborhood starts. Of like everybody has a pool, um, you know, and and you know, it's really immaculate homes and and there's stuff like these big places and stuff like that, like those are like start about four or five houses down. So, and then like the house, my neighbor, I mean, that thing is just massive. I mean, it has like two furnaces in it and big pillars out in the front and, you know, four or 5,000 square feet. So, you know, I have like a, I have like a regular house, but like there are kind of no, no, there's no room for a carport and it just, it wouldn't, it wouldn't fit in. Um, so my neighbor across the road, actually paid two thousand dollars to have somebody come and do their land their landscape just trim their trees and everything over the weekend paid two grand so that kind of gives you an idea of some of the like i spent eight hours today just like mowing my lawn and dying my mulch i mean like i kind of like the expectations in the neighborhood to keep things like most of the people adhere to that they keep things really really cool like really really super well kept um like I, I mow patterns into the lawn and like people do that kind of stuff. Um, so, but, um, let me build it. It fits. I promise. So I need to uh, have some concrete work done. So I can't find anybody like everybody who was like willing to do it two years ago. There's like nobody out there now. I got to have like a concrete pad replaced and some other stuff. So, so live in between the rich folks and the ghetto. I, I live, um, yeah, my, I, I live on the cusp of like where the really fancy homes kind of went in. Like the people that own like the ski resort, like our four houses down from me, you know? So that is, uh, so it's, it's kind of, it's cool. I mean, like in a trick or treating, Every year we get 800 to 1,000 kids in our neighborhood. They'll, they'll block off our neighborhood with barricades because people come from all over. Because people give out the full-size candy bars and all that, that stuff. And we don't give that out. I mean, I'm not, that's not rich. But I do like put on like a really good display 
I spend the day, you know, getting our, our property all ready. And it's not like too spooky. So if you're like a three-year-old, you're going to be freaked out, not able to sleep. But like people will have their picture taken on our property when it, the stuff I do. And I got like the flying ghost and I put uh, military grade glow sticks in the trees. So, which is really cool. Um, but, uh, but yeah, anyway. Um, so I don't know how we got off talking about that, but, uh, but, oh yeah, man, I, no, there's, I've, for concrete pillow, I've got to hire out. I mean, I had this all quoted out and I didn't go with it a year ago because I was having a concrete curbing put around the house and I didn't want to, I wanted that done first and then the concrete slab second, but now everybody's gone. So I'll have to keep like working on that. So there, there was a concrete slab added to the right of my garage, probably 25 years before we live here. But it was for the guy who lived here, it was for his boat. And the whatever, like it was never put down right because it like severely cracked and like, you know, it's up an inch and a half in some spots. And it just, it's really, it needs to be replaced. There's no saving it. But it's been pressing against the foundation and causing some issues. So it's kind of bad. Um, interesting. I can't find anyone to refinish a bathtub. It seems like a more splinter skill. It seems like concrete. You'd have more people kind of jumping at that opportunity. Um, so I'll have to get back at it. I, sh I knew I should have done it at the time I had like an offer and a guy who was recommended to me by someone who had done some work on her house. I'm like, it, it just was a good vibe and I didn't, I didn't act on it and I should have, but, uh, so that's where you got to learn to do as much stuff as you can, but I'm not going to sledgehammer out a concrete slab and put in a new one on my own. No way. But, uh, so. So let me do this. Um, so we, we talked about lost person behavior. Would I buy this book just to read it? Probably not. <laughs> I mean, I buy it cause I'm a safety guy, but it's really cool. Like, Boy, Robert Koyster, I mean, in his presentations, you know, so really good. Like, you know, comes into a nursing, you know, home or something or assisted living or school. Like, he's right on telling you, here's here's likely if a kid wanders. Like, here's probably where you're going to find him. Here's what to do. I, I think, like, when he's involved in a rescue, I was reading something. But the the chances of finding someone are, like, 93 or 97%. I forget, but the guy's just really good. Like, in a splinter area, like, who who does this? Like, who who goes through all of this stuff and does like he you know does does these these things of like a 3d like here's where you're probably i mean the guy's just so good so you gotta have people like that out there right um school of airs man it's got 54 reviews i would love for this thing to have more reviews um so please right if you've read it i mean it's like 20 bucks um, is a really good book. And even if you're not into school safety, when I interviewed Katie Pashan of KG Navy Relief and Hurricane Irma and all this, I mean, she's really good. The 9-11 stuff is really good. Um, uh, is a great book. So come on, please. And philosophy of information is a hard copy, but you can get it in paperback. And, uh, this is an awesome book, 12 interviews with people who don't re really Give interviews like Larry Lawton, you know, 1.5 million YouTube followers, uh, Linda Stone, uh, Morgan uh, Rogue, and uh, Robert Travis, Juan Brown, you know, the pilot over Orville Dam. And I mean, th just great interviews, custom figures in here. It's it's cited, but it's cited like at the end of the chapters. So like as you're reading it, you're not going to be like, oh, like, here's another citation. It's really well put together. And then a lot of the stuff in this book, um, people will forget it that they went through that like in 2020, like there's a whole right away. We get in the chapter of essential versus non-essential and Carl Mankey, the barber in Oswa, Michigan. I've had so many people contact me and say, you know, when I read that, I totally forgot that one morning I woke up and I was deemed essential or non-essential. I completely forgot about it, Dave. And I'm like, well, yeah. And then how does it impact you down the road? Like in any career you take or your kids or where you live, can you do remote work? Are you going to live in a city? Are you going to live somewhere where there's an elevator because you have to socially distance and only one person can be on an elevator? Like it was a big thing in Seattle. People left because they're like, well, I can't, I mean, we, I can't be in a building where I live on the 34th floor and we can only have two people in an elevator at a time or one person. I mean, 
So I talked to a realtor and I interviewed her and she's, you know, quoted her in here. And she's, you know, that was a big reason. People were like, I can, I'm going to do this. So that's an awesome book. And um, you can get that one. Well, right. Places to sell books, but it's a really good book. That has 19 reviews. And I would love for that book, obviously, to have more. It's being considered right now for the S.I. Hayakawa Award is the best nonfiction um, semantic work. That'll be determined in September. So like now, like... If you do that, it's really important to do it now. If you're thinking, if you read the book, um, to do do your review now, guys. If you've if you've had it, like get the review up there because this is the time it really counts. Um, yeah, Velocity of Information is a phenomenal book, and and uh, it, it gets better as time every day passes because nobody was doing the in vivo documentation, sifting and sorting, and kind of writing the story that I was writing. Like nobody did that. And now, if you try to do it, you wouldn't have the context, you'd have to kind of be guessing of what I remember of the time versus actually writing it during the time. It's just a really good book. Somebody left a two-star review and they didn't post um, any comment. So in order to post stars, you had to buy the book to be verified. You know, you just can't do that without posting a comment, but they never wrote a comment. So I was like, what's the deal? A two-star review? Okay. But then what sucked about it? Like, what did you like about it? At least then I'll know um, I mean, if you leave a two-star review and don't post, so that kind of sucked. But so, yes, uh, you know, anybody out there listening, right? If you have it now, please, please get out there and post a review. The book every day shows up in more and more libraries around the world. So I track that. School of Errors continues to show up in more libraries. So that's really cool. Um, so Bolo, I do like a good postal digger. I used to do that when we were on the farm. We had a manual. Postal digger. I'll set one behind the tracker. Um, an auger will kill you. It's true. Rocks. I cried when I was deemed essential. Yes, essential. Right? I mean, some people, right, if you worked at a grocery store, you're deemed essential, right? And you might get 30 cents an hour more. Or truck drivers, you're deemed essential. But then all the waysides were closed down and the, the truck stops. And we didn't do anything for National Guard, right, to keep four truck stops open in every state or, or to keep four waysides open and to supply water and food and maybe showers and washing facilities. I mean, we didn't do any of that. What in the hell, right? So, I mean, forensically looking back on this, like how in the world was that allowed to happen? Um, I woke up one morning, this is CNT, one morning and found out according to the FBI, oh, you're on a list. Yeah, I covered that in my fall class, and I do it with a case study I changed for apparel, and I changed what the student was wearing. I think as a, a Betsy Ross flag is what I had. The student was wearing a Betsy Ross flag, and another student says, you know, that uh, I'm, I'm offended by the flag and a staff member, and then comes to the principal, and then boom, case, case study kind of starts. Principal takes a certain course of action, then as superintendent, right, what do you do? So... I did incorporate that into a case study that I rewrote a couple weeks ago. Um, so, CNT, hey, safety doc, but your two-star review, <laughs> I don't know, man. Is it, you know, Joe Dolio, like, if you write a book and stuff like as Joe said, and other friends are right, but if someone leaves a, a bad review, I mean, that's par for the course. I mean, if you get 20 reviews, you're not everyone's going to be in, in your ball park, right? Or they'll find something like, you know, because the book is pretty critical on the TikTok dancing of nurses. So like, if, you know, if you're a nurse, you read that books, you're probably going to have a negative reaction. But, um, but then, you know, write something, right? Like, write, you know, I think this unfairly, whatever. Okay. Like it's, that's value versus just like the straight out, you know, two star, but um, yeah. I don't know, man. What eighty-six thousand more IRS agents? That's pretty crazy. So, we have eighty-six thousand more IRS agents, and how many more um, elementary teachers came out of the bill, or, or the, either they're safer schools or inflation? None. Now, as Chad Elkins will say, IRS does need to be updated, right? They're still running like a cobalt system. Um, and there are systems definitely, there are things that need to happen. Um, but 
what did we hear? And as Chad said on um, the Elkins Hour, which is phenomenal, right? His, his podcast. But as he said, we heard all about like the 86,000 agents. You didn't hear the parts of the bill of saying, you know, they're still running a system from 1988 that's like a cobalt, I guess is what it's called. It's like even before like Windows 95 or whatever. So he said they need the software update so they can process things and merge more uh, seamlessly with like a uh, TurboTax or whatever. And so yeah, like Chad brought out like a bigger perspective saying like there's things, because like for all of us, right, eventually you're not going to have your tax returns are going to be like delayed or not processed or things or, but like, you know, it was just like, oh, it's 86,000 agents. So I don't know. I just probably got audited because I said that. Audit C and T. No, don't do that. It's a good guy. Um, C and T, just abolish the IRS. Yeah, flat tax. I'm not against that. So, kind of with you on that. My property taxes just sort of went crazy. I mean, my I lived here 20 years, and my tax, my property taxes, are projected at a minimum to be up 16 percent in December for this year, and could be higher than that. That's big, man. Um, so what's COBL? I don't know, man. CO, CO, Bolo, Cobol. Oh, Cobol. That's the language, common business oriented language. Sorry. That's the, um, thanks. That's the, uh, language used for business and finance. So the, uh, looks like that's from first appeared in 1959. The stable release was 1989. So, yeah. So Chad was saying that there is an early version of that that is being used by the IRS, right? Because if you if you update, to do a sweeping update would be massive. You'd have to train all these people. And that's why like even banks and big companies and all that, they tend to stay with these old operating systems. So because it just takes, it's, it's a beast to try to upgrade. We're all spies, spies like us. Remember Chevy Chase? You look, you interpret, but what you do. So I, I posted a video a day or two ago about, um, I took that video in March of 2020 of Bellevue, Washington, when they had their police website and they said, hey, you can report social gatherings. They had like a, you could drag from a Google map. Like I had all that, right? I still have all the screen shares. And, and yet, you know, the cra that was crazy. But another crazy part was you also had police um, at that stage, like socially distanced, some people stay home, stay in different groups because if these people become infected, like they're out, right? So you don't want to lose all your, for your force. So why would you focus on responding to a gathering of five people at somebody's house when there might be a car accident, right? I mean, the priorities, it was just really, it was really weird. And part of like what on that website went down, there were others, but like I have all I captured. Um, but you know, where did that ever make sense to put resources into that? And then everybody who submitted pictures, because there was a tab you could submit a picture. So you could take a picture of your neighbors, four pe five people together in your neighbor's house and submit it. What happened to those pictures, right? And are you going to be able to, is, is that going to be public someday? If like, here's the people that were reported. It, was, it just, it didn't make, it had no face validity to it, right? Of saying, we're going to enforce this, but at a time when straight everything is trained and we need our police to respond to the most urgent of things. So I wrote about it in school of errors and I do have it cited, but I don't include a screenshot. My publisher thought it was too risky to, to do that. So I backed off. Like when I present, I talk about it and I do that little 45 second clip and stuff like that, but otherwise I don't do it. Um, Ohio, Steve. Have you heard? I need three more subscribers to this channel, by the way. Have you heard about people starting a trust so that you don't have to pay tax? I haven't heard about that. No. Um, BV Luminous, and you still pay property taxes, sale tax, unless you really know what to do or did already by accident. So, yeah. Like I said, my property taxes are yikes. Wisconsin is a bad state for property taxes, but man. And like I live in a more a smaller community that's pretty blue collar and you know hasn't taken on like crazy expenditures 
Um, so, you know, but there are places around us where my house will be double, triple the property taxes of, of what I'm, you know, paying right here. So, so what did we learn in the last three hours and 44 minutes and 59 seconds? Lost person behavior. So if you're, if you're lost, best thing is to just stay where you're at, right? Um, people will find you. If you have a whistle, do three blasts. That's a universal indicator of danger or, or in distress. If you have rocks or sticks, click, click them together three times. Yell, help, 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 like three times. Don't take your possessions and try to like make a big area of like, oh, I'll put this like, you know, 100 feet from me, like a jacket or this stuff, like, you know, keep your stuff with you. Um, we also learned that, you know, schools typically don't don't practice for wandering kids, although we know that happens. There are um, a couple hundred times a year kids wander. Actually, in this, this article, this blog post, in February 2022, an eight-year-old boy with autism wandered away from the school and walked home alone. Um, this was near uh, Detroit, and he had to cross three busy streets to get there. So, you know, um, this does happen. This this does happen. So you, you might not be able to anticipate the first time it happens, but if it happens, there's a, a strong likelihood that wandering is a repeat behavior with, with uh, children. So you have to have a plan for this, right? And, you know, so you run into these questions, can you trespass in order to search for somebody? And then we get this thing called the law of necessity, which Lisa Linney, who's an attorney, is going to talk about on the show, just so you have an idea. Um, but yeah, these are all, these are really, it's really good things. And um, yeah, it's good stuff. So let's go back to the uh, the chat as we wrap up. Spambot saying my property tax went up 30% last year. That sucked. Yikes. Man, I hope I don't get that, get that surprise. Don't burn down the forest to save yourself. Right. Forest. So, um, yeah, that's good stuff. So a couple shows coming up that I'm really excited about. Um, a, a pilot. A, a, a pilot is going to be on my show. He contacted me and said, you know, I, I love the channel, right? Um, and... I think there's some interface between um, like flying safety as, as a pilot and school safety, and then also making decisions, stuff like that. I, I think it'd be really good. So we're going to talk this week. He's excited. So that'll be a cool show. I haven't had anybody on like that. Um, and then uh, Lisa Lenny is going to be returning in the next few weeks to talk about, Hey, like when does the law of necessity kick in? Like, right. If you have to do, if you have to break a, a rule in order to, for the greater good, right? Like I talked about the 16 year old kid who calls 911 and says, this person is weaving in front of me. I think they're drunk or impaired. And they're like, okay, keep following him. And he, it's toward his time. He has to be back. He can't drive legally after 10 o'clock. So police get there and 10 30, they arrest a guy. And then they're like, whoa, you know, um, the, the kid gets a ticket. So then he has to go to court and say, and the 911 told me to keep following him. And if I, by following him, the police were able to get here and it was more likely this guy was going to hurt himself or hurt others than me, you know, being out late, there'd be some consequence. And the judge, boom, cleared it. And uh, and then also the Good Samaritan Law. Like These are things you, as, as we talk about, like, why, why isn't anybody talking about this? There's nobody, there's never a breakout in a school session at a, the state conference, national conference. There's never a breakout about like Good Samaritan Law and where it might interface with school staff <laughs> or the law of necessity. I've never seen that. Like, it makes sense, perfect sense. I'll tell you, it doesn't happen because people believe they would have to take a position on something, and then if someone referenced them, they could be in trouble. It's kind of like the template. Like, I don't want to give a template because then you might do exactly what I did, and if it doesn't turn out for you, then it's not my fault. So I don't like it. I don't like it at all. I used to run big conferences. If I was running a conference today, I would definitely do a break, and I bet you it would be packed. There would be standing room only on the law of necessity and uh, the Good Samaritan. So, um, CT, the safety tax, skipping school is a recurring behavior too. Trust me. Yeah. Um, that you can record, you can find a little bit more through like transient. Um, 
and some of that gets gets kind of smudged if you if you do an abeyance agreement where you say oh like the student's been missing a lot of schools so now we'll do like they can log in from home or whatever so an hour i mean i've seen stuff literally where it's been like if they log in an hour a week like we'll count that as attendance so um but you're right like uh, these things are happening it probably isn't a good record uh, if an autistic um uh, kid left school it's because they didn't want to be there so yeah i mean in this instance the kid wanted to be home that, that was like he walked home um and there are instances though where uh, kids have gone into woods like because they're interested in their or like machinery or they're next to you know stuff that they they they're kind of so when you search for for children with autism it's likely you're going to find them um per lost person behavior which specifically looked at that toward you know big pieces of machinery um toward a, a large landmark toward a river something like that it's unlikely they would just be like in the middle of a field so that's where they're like go check out these things um and the fact they're able to speak volumes gotcha bv bolo making a citizen's arrest in canada was a big waste of my time lesson learned citizens arrest bolo throws a big red light on top of his car he's doing 95. citizens arrest bolo wow that's interesting like i would i'd like to have somebody on i have to be a lawyer who specializes in in, in law and say like hey you know like back in the 80s right 70s and 80s like citizens arrest was kind of a thing like you would see it in movies and stuff like is there still such a thing as a citizens arrest or would you like be wrongfully detaining someone or what, what does that mean today is it is there any condition today where citizens arrest would apply man i got i'm gonna make a note on that because i do have an attorney i, I think would maybe be interested in just doing a little speculation on that but yeah, that, that used to be a thing. Citizens arrest. BV Luminous Doc, people are more interested in things that directly affect their daily lives. True. But um, when I go back to this, the school stuff, though, I think like the school conferences are what is delivered is usually stuff that's easy, right? Um, like how to, how to relax or some other things. Like it's not the hardcore stuff of um the question right like what if um how, how to write a policy and how to guide people if they get caught in a situation where the discretion has to be used like someone's driving a bus load of kids right or whatever and um and there's a protest but let's say it's not even protest it's a weather disaster like what is what's your process for teaching people what level of discretion they have those would be great breakouts or even keynotes you know, bring in Admiral Lloyd. It's like, talk about 9-11. Talk about, you know, how you made the decision at New York Harbor to say, if you got a boat, come down here and help. And knowing all the chips would fall on your shoulders, good or bad. Um, BB's saying, it's difficult to explain the need to learn something people haven't been harmed or helped by yet. That's true, right? Yeah, people, people aren't, yeah, you're very right on with that, right? Um, people th think very, linear and right if you if you if it's something um that has an impact and, and maybe that some of that is good like you don't want a school to to try to to every contingency plan but yeah bolo saying i told him you owe me 250 bucks and i'll let you go oh my god bolo now that does sound dangerous i thought you saw somebody commit like a crime and you were trying to do a citizen's arrest so yeah, this that is that's a show. I've I need to find someone who's willing to come on and and just even talk about maybe the history of that or when that actually worked and just like is there any place that still exists? You know, is there one area in Canada? It's like four miles from where Bolo lives, where they still enforce like the citizens' arrest. So. BV. Yeah, it's a good learning process. Get people to think about things with a story. That's a part of the velocity of information, right? So there's a lot of concepts I talk about in velocity of information, force majeure, like, you know, when you just say, we can't do this anymore. We can't meet our needs. We can't keep bringing in food to this area because we have no workers and whatever. So we, we got to fault out in our contract. 
um, wet bulb, like too much information going. Um, I tell those through stories, like, you know, the 12 interviews. So Bolo, you basically just describe strong arming. Jeepers, Bolo. Be careful, my friend. So, yeah. Um, Bolo saying, it was a camera. It was on camera. He destroyed my property. Someone else called the officials. Holy smokes. So Bolo had a 1976 Trans Am. And he was eastbound and down. So... Wow, what, what song did you play when you were doing the chase? Take care. Um, all right, well, guys, it is 1226 here. Um, yeah, Bolo, actually, for that, I, I don't think you'd have a <laughs> – I think you'd be cooked in a in a court, man. You know, if, if some if, if someone was saying, you know, I'm going to go and, you know, bring harm to other people and they show you, like, you know, whatever, and they take off, you know, maybe that's a compelling thing, but, yeah, I don't Property crime isn't gonna isn't gonna make it. Um, so, but uh, I don't know. But you're Bolo, Bolo. So, Bolo's like two hundred fifty dollars. I want it now. Guy pulls out like a sack of change. Would, Bolo, would you have done it? It would have taken him three hours to count it out. So, and it's all on on the hood of your Trans Am. I could scratch the paint, scratch clear coat. Um. He's like, I'll write you a check. I don't know. It's, it's iffy. Yeah. <laughs> Is that for, do you really not? Um, yeah, I can. Oh, the Giants lost to the Padres. Or oh, they're losing in the eighth inning, top of the eighth, six to two. So the Giants are losing six to two to the Padres. That's bad. That's not that's not good for you, Andrew. The other team won by no, maybe it is if they no. Doc, tell me the San, Giants. I got the wrong. Yeah, the Giants. So the, the Padres have six, the Giants have two. It's top of the eighth. So I'm not really a gambling man here, but whatever needs to happen there, I hope it works out for you. Uh Bolo's like, I am Bolo. Bolo's license plate just says Bolo. Bolo. Like, if you're getting chased and you're looking at the roof of the mirror and your license plate is like, it's a Trans Am, it says Bolo, you're like, oh, God. Oh, my God. Being chased by Bolo. Like, I don't know, man. I would, that changes things, right? Like, Bolo's behind me. What do I do? You're like, you sure Bolo? It's Canadian plates. B O L O. Like, holy, is this Trans Am? It is. You're on your own, man. Personally, I pull over. Like, I don't, you don't want to mess the bolo. So that's kind of the thinking that would go on. Someone calls. You're like, hey, uh, yeah. You're sure it's B-O. It's not like B-O-L-O. It's not like a zero. It's not like someone pretending to be bolo, like a B-zero. No, it's, a, it's definitely, a, definitely no. It's bolo. It's Canada. They're like, oh, damn it. Damn it. I'd pull over if I were you. Pull over. It's a cool guy. But yeah, you don't want to, you don't want to, you don't want this chase. Bolo has a uh, several, several uh, uh, levels of knowledge in citizen's arrest. I mean, it's like a karate for him. He comes up, he's got it down. Uh, he's like a, a martial arts equivalent to uh, citizens arrest is Bolo. He's like this citation, this, whatever you have the right, whatever, you know, the case law. So really, you don't want to mess with it. Like the guy is just so good. Well, I don't, uh, Bolo, I didn't think that was your, your, but you're still Bolo. Even if you're not really Bolo, like on your tax return, you're still Bolo. So, it's just like Burt Reynolds was the bandit in Smoking the Bandit. He was the bandit, will always be the bandit, even though he's Burt Reynolds. You will always be Bolo, which is the Canadian equivalent of the bandit in Smoking the Bandit. At what point in your following is it construed as talking, though? Man, I don't know. I'm, I'm, yeah, I'm not, I've never really been in that situation. So, um, yeah. I don't know. You know, I'm glad though we got to the, the citizens arrest thing because I I really am looking forward to 
and again, I think I have a, I think I have the attorney who would talk about that, at least say, here's what it was. And like, here's what I'm aware. And here's like, if you were to apply it in court, like here's the barriers you'd have to overcome. Or here's like, I might be able to su successfully do it. I don't know. Holy smokes. So spam bot is actually how many hours away? I'm a, I'm less than a thousand hours away. So you have to have 4,000 hours to be monetized. So, um, and it continues to go up. So I appreciate everybody who's been watching the shows. And again, there are great shows out there. There's 184 shows at safetyphd.com. You go to YouTube, boom, the playlist. Um, and, you know, go, go on the interviews, right? And also, you know, I've got some great interviews coming up. Um, Josh the Locksmith, man, that was a good interview. That was what, a couple of months ago. So, but all of you guys, you know, watching some of the, the previous stuff is, is helping. It's really showing because like, it's going to happen now. I mean, it's no longer a question. All the other check boxes, you know, are, are checked. I mean, we just, we need, just need to get more watch hours. Um, so yes. So anyway, um, the blog post for this will be up tomorrow. I already wrote it. I just have to go up and, and post it. Um, this will be out on Podbean and MP3. If for some reason you have a reason to listen to four hours of, of this, I, I actually prefer long podcast if I'm doing work outside or if I have some like long bike thing, I'll throw in like a a four six hour podcast of somebody like I'll pull you know um so yeah yeah the lock picking lawyer he's I, I follow his channel I don't know that guy's so he's pretty famous I don't know if he would charity down but you know Larry Lawton came on the show and I think Larry gets this just crazy amount of like super chats when he does a show like in the thousands and thousands of dollars Larry Lawton's a really really cool guy he's a smart guy um and, but yeah, lockpick and lawyer. Um, I think Lato's law, I think Steve Lato would be, be awesome. If Lato came on and talked about citizens arrest, like that's right in Steve Lato's area, like Fuchi that there's a lawyer out there too. I forget his name, like kind of on, on, uh, on YouTube. I think that'd be really cool. Uh, I'll well, just help you listen to well, well, thanks buddy. Appreciate that. He won't show his face, but his knowledge of the set. Yeah. Right, yeah. Um, so back when I was in college, I had pretty good lock picking skills because um, if you we got locked out of our apartment, we had a there was a charge with the landlord to have him come and open it. So and it so I learned and so did my roommates. Like you know, back in the day, like it wasn't it wasn't real hard to pick a, a key, but I um, I had a rake. It was. I think we all did. I think I don't know. And and in thirty seconds, you could be inside your apartment. I never got into anybody else's place that way, but like our own. <laughs> I'm, like, I'm not paying ten dollars to our landlord to unlock the door, you know. Um, so which I'm trying to think, where did we keep, or did we just have like I, the rake? I don't know, but every once in a while. Um, so Nick Rakita, yeah, I've seen Rakita Law. So that's another one. I have to reach out to some of these. Um, so, but well, anyway, guys, I know I've, I've tried to shut the show down a few times. You guys are awesome in the chat. Really appreciate all of you. I really do appreciate all of you. Um, you know, BV, Spambot, um, you know, Andrew, Bolo, um, because yeah, I mean, I sometimes to, to just, put these shows together to write the blog post. Um, it really helps me to frame these things, which are really important, right? And I think as you're listening to it, I'm putting stuff out there that normally isn't covered by other people. And and there might be some things you take away from this and say, you know what, I, I didn't know this. I didn't know whatever. And Or, you know, Doc was talking about, you know, um, the, the school stuff where, you know, if you separate two kids in a fight and whatever, you can lose your job or be put on leave and stuff like that. I didn't know this stuff could happen, whatever. Or, or the, the three blasts are, you know, the, the signs of I'm in distress, right? You know, um, but I it helps me organize this and then, you know, kind of uh, refine it and take it out into like the people I, I teach and stuff. And so, you know, I refine it when I get here. But then like there's stuff that you share with me because you guys kind of know me like you know, you're following the show, right? And 
So I'll be like, oh God, like, you know, BV pointed out something or like whatever and or Bolo or and Bacon, you know, put something out there. I, I got to look into that. Like it's something I got to, I got to think about. So, um, yeah, that is, uh, that is, so I appreciate, appreciate all of you. So I'm going to take us out, um, here and, um, I will, uh, I'll see you soon. I don't know if the next, but within the next couple of weeks, we've got two interviews coming up, but I don't know if I'll be doing like, I don't know what the next couple of shows are. I'm kind of working on a few, a few things, but again, lost person behavior. Um, if you, Robert Koyster again, and he, he has there's a lot of videos of him presenting on YouTube. That's just fascinating stuff to watch, right? And the 411, the David Polite stuff. If you're into that, you definitely would be into Robert Koyster. There, it's it's kind of similar, um, you know, in that regard. So th there's some crossover. You know, Koyster definitely is the the more scientific approach to that. But again, Polite's is also very scientific. So. Yes, you don't want just anybody coming to your house. So, oh my goodness, you guys. All right, um, I'm going to uh, take us out here and buy my books. Shameless plug, come on. Read my books, email your library. I'll take you one minute, email your library. I love your, get this book. It really helps, I really appreciate it. Um, because again, these are the things that the, the mainstream media, you know, the vendors don't want out there and stuff like that. It's really a good thing. So, all right, everybody, take care. As chaos erupts, torrents of conflicting yet urgent messages gush from media outlets. What is the magnitude of the incident and what should people do to protect themselves? Dr. David Perodin clarifies human behavior during days, weeks, months, or even years of chaos. Reporter James David Dixon of the Detroit News proclaims, the velocity of information is an education in the way people react and adapt to change. Never has it been more important to sift facts and stories for truth and meaning. The velocity of information will teach you how people have done it in history, in the modern day, and even in prison. There are teachable moments on every page. By the Velocity of Information, Human Thinking During Chaotic Times. Available from your favorite bookstore or online retailer. A must read for parents, teachers, and taxpayers. Dr. David Perodin has written the most honest book about the $3 billion school safety industrial complex. Attorney James Sibley proclaims, a brave demonstration of speaking truth to power. School of Errors rips the lid off the billion dollar school safety industry. Using real world examples of successful responses in desperate situations, David contrasts the expensive window dressings pitched to panic parents with the inexpensive and effective approaches proven to actually work. Read this book before you let your school waste another precious dollar on meaningless safety theater. By the international bestseller, School of Errors, Rethinking School Safety in America, now at Barnes & Noble or Amazon. Describe the odor. Is it like when something electrical is burning? And so on. Ridiculous, right? We don't shift the investigation to the reporter, but that's covertly what the school district thought needed to happen to prevent their investigation scrambling principles from burning out. And as this paragraph smolders, it would be prudent to consider bringing students with disabilities from the sidelines of safety and center them to active roles of detecting and reporting threats. So we had a rather difficult meeting. Upon due diligence of examining the reporting system, I informed the district representative that I could not justify modifications to the existing model as such changes would make the system less accessible to students. Well, that was a short chit chat. The district folks believed or hoped that the threat input system could be modified and maintained with fidelity. I wasn't in alignment with that hypothesis. And so I was thanked and given notice that our partnership would be over at month's end. Business is business, but in school safety, it's never as simple as that. Thank you here is Dr. David Harrison. 
David is a speech language pathologist specializing in psycholinguistics. He's the author of The Velocity of Information, Human Thinking During Chaotic Times, and has been teaching in our educational leadership program for more than 15 years. Students in the superintendent's current and legal issues course share. Dr. Pearson is helpful, organized, and empathetic with content knowledge that is off the charts. Students in this course also share that they consult with David as they navigate especially difficult situations in their own district. Thank you for sharing your talents with our students, David, and congratulations. Hi everybody, this is the Safety Doc with a face validity check-in here on March 31st, 2020. Bellevue, Washington has started a tool to report stay-home violations. This is from the government website in Bellevue, Washington. So we're going to scroll down here to my Bellevue portal and then to report gatherings. They've made it convenient. There's a map on the right. You can drag a location over here into address, write a description, and then also include photos. This is a practice we've seen in some areas of the country, but it's gonna be more prevalent. Look for it in your area, probably in the next week or two.